what kind of work shall we let's see hopefully this should all be working let's get the chat out uh pop out the chat how are you all doing today oh we're doing well um firewood pellegrino wants to know right then Let's see. Oh, we got a little bit. See if that's better. Ooh. Hello, everyone. We're having fun today. Right. First of all, I need to get the pile of books out. So, very beneath these books, which I was using for something last night. Ooh. E by gum. And I do have a little bit of news, courtesy of work, a new webcam has arrived, which is r rather cute. We're going to see if we can get it to work. And, you know, hello, El hello, Daniel, hello, Richard, hello, Albert, hello, Jack, Zach. Ray, Jack Ray, hello Angus, hello Blue Shirt Buddha, hello Daniel Freeman, Vigilant, hello, rereading James Cobb, Choosers of the Slain, read years ago in high school, interesting book about USN Stealth Destroyer, first of the series, online reviews say later books go off the rails. Yeah, but it's quite cool for a beginning. Hi Martin, uh, hello Jay, hello Richard. Oh, or is it hello? Hello Stephanie. Hello King George the Fifth. Hello Banhol. Hello everyone. Good lord, we've got a lot of people online tonight. Hello Strub. Um, can you please do a video on one of the most misunderstood naval forces, the U.S. Coast Guard? You have a better grasp of the on it than most Americans. I do love the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, I have to say, uh, it was. My love for them started with my procurement of this book. <sighs> the Chronology of the War at Sea by um, Jürgen Roh. And it's just amazing how much stuff they get involved and get up to. And they really do get involved and up to so, so much stuff. And uh, as I, I was reading from you guys last time when we talked about the convoys, the convoys they were in. They were in a lot of convoys. Right, important thing I need to get out of the way. Or rather, get in the way. Uh, cake. That's my um, treat for when I complete the books. All right then. Hello, Carl. Hello, Carl. <laughs> hello, Donald. Um, hello, Jay Richardson. Hello, Greg. Hello, Potter. Hello, Tony. Hello, Gordon Collins. Hello, Dr. Lager. Hello, Stafford. And hello, everyone else I know is watching. So, hi to my mum. Hi to my girlfriend. Hi to my girlfriend's mum. Hi to my sister. Hi to all my cousins. Okay, I do know some little ones are watching. Hello. Apparently you're wa you're watching me by choice rather than television because I'm better than the television on. Really random cousin. Um, so hello to you all, but that will mean because I know little ones are watching that I will be trying to keep the language as clear as possible. Mainly so I don't have a lot of let's say the parent members of my family hunting me down with pitchforks. <laughs> Banana zombie gnome, banana zombie gnome. Jebbian, afternoon all, just finished reading a previous book of Falklands and listening to part two of the panel with Clap, Thompson and Larkin. That was a very, very fun thing. Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about the podcast on Simsec. I did with Clap, Thompson and Larkin. That was a very, very fun podcast to do. That was a few years back, and I think Michael is going to do a YouTube video with me. And I might, after that, start working through with a few others. And as I said, like all the teaching ones and all the 
joint ones. There also might be another joint one coming up with me and Jamie from Armored Carriers. Um, looking through things. And of course, the podcasts for Bilge Pumps do go pace. I know they haven't come up, but that's because it's getting its own stream and all sorts of things. And basically, we've been a victim of our own success on that one. In that we've been so successful that now Simsec want to advertise it and do all sorts of things. Which is lovely. We want that. And we really want people to keep, people keep listening to Bilge Pumps and enjoying it. But it has meant do, arranging all the things and putting all the things in place has meant things have been delayed. <laughs> Hello, Michael. Hello, John. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. I'm looking bright today. There's a lot of good pictures. A lot of good light going on here around at the moment. It won't last too long. It's in a plastic bottle today, General. Yes. I have used up all my lovely glass bottles. So I'm onto plastic bottles. But it's still, broadly speaking, there. It's the cheaper stuff, it, you know. <laughs> it ain't the same, Martin, as you put in the, in the plastic bottle, but it's still okay. It's a 90% solution. You know, this is your Type 26, Type 45 Zumwalt. This is your Type 31. It's not quite the same, but it hits the spot. <clears throat> the bilge pumps they are coming through they are there are a few good ones coming through for bilge pumps um let's see what was the one what were we we ended up doing carry aviation we did do we were asked to do Jimi hendrix and comment on his recent paper and we sort of did that in our own sort of way and Oh, did we have fun with it. And we ended up with, we went through from that and we went on to what modern ships look like and design and what they learn. I think at one point I did compare one particular class of warship, which is currently being mooted, as looking like it was inspired by the clone trooper's helmet <laughs> from Star Wars. Because I could see no other reason for having that shape. <laughs> oh... And before anyone worries about the Iron Bruin running out of it, there is one advantage using the cheap stuff. There is a second bottle. So, you're having a Type 1 cup of tea. Well, as you will see in, there is a list below this of all the books which are going to be looked at. Um, the other books I did want to have was some from the Pacific series, Helmet for My Pillow, etc., which I do actually have but turns out one of my students actually had them i'd given them to them pre-lockdown and i've forgotten but they have very nicely said they're going they are almost finished with them so they're going to mail them to me so i will look at those at another time <laughs> oh. Tony Penville, going for quantity over quality tonight, then. Um, sometimes you need to max the qu uh, match the quality and the quantity. That's when it, the mini t-shirt. It's it's not too new, but it's been around for a while. Right, so I'm going to save this one for last, but it's very cool, and when you hear about it, you're all going to be wanting to go to Amazon for it because it is such a cool book. So, I'm going to start off with my least favourite of the collection. Anthony Beaver's D-Day. If you want something which attempts to cover every single aspect in every single detail, this is basically someone attempting to do, do Nicholas Rogers, you know, Command of the Oceans, but for D-Day. He doesn't quite hit everything, but that's because he's trying to cover so much. And... But it's, it's got some nice pictures. It's got some very nice maps in it. Things like this. Um, 
I don't think it gives enough attention to the complexity of the naval side of the campaign. It's very much focused on the land side of the amphibious warfare operation. But there again, there is an understanding for that because the amphibious uh, the land side of the operation is quite so massive. But there is the fact that in all the pictures I go through, there is that one. I have looked through the pictures and frankly, in terms of pictures of the landing craft, in terms of pictures of the ships, it's just not there. So I have to talk about it because it's the big one. You know, it's Anthony Beaver. He's got Max Hastings as one of his experts. But there again, Max Hastings and me are always going to be having an interesting relationship. Um, Anthony Beaver. It, it's a book to read, yes. And I have it. I got it because it was free for two at Waterstones. And, um... Yeah, I'm glad I have it, but I have to say it's not my favourite. But it's something which you should read. This one is slightly more on that, the scale of things. Gallipoli by L.A. Carolyn. Published... Oh, I forget when it was published. Um, published 2002-2003. And this is a very interesting book. Again... It seems to me quite heavily focused on the land side of the Gallipoli campaign, but it does give some interesting points about the seaside, and I like the pictures. And I like the fact that the author is trying very hard to present the Anzacs and give them their full account, as well as giving full account to the uh, Turks and the, in well, the Ottomans and... Well, Mostly dead Turks, but the Ottomans mainly, and you know all the uh, all the other factors involved in it. It's it's a very well done in terms of choreographed historiography of the campaign. It's one which is worth reading if you're interested in it. I'm just thinking of a Jimi Hendrix inspired ship having a watchtower. <clears throat> Possibly. Um, right. I was looking at Drax's list of five minute guides, and in five weeks it's the Indian and Blue oh, well, Boy, that's going to be a round and a half. Ye trust me, you have no idea. Um, Bidron, some modern locomotives even look like helmets from Star Wars. The reason is crash crush devices in the cab that will cushion an impact. There is no reason to design a ship superstructure like it, though. There is a huge pointy thing in front of you called the bow before you have to crash into the superstructure. Like, if your superstructure is crashing into something, you have a lot of problems, and worrying about a crash impact, a crumble impact zone is not one of them. Uh... <clears throat> Do you want? Hello, been dragging a height storm over the Gilbert's details on building of Upper Pacific um, operations. That's cool. Uh, Dr. Lark, the difficulty of Gilbert is the place it has in the Anzac mythos and the sense of military identity. Um, this book does manage to cover that quite well. It's difficult to pierce, but it's also well earned in places, so it's it's a good book. It's a, it's a book I'd quite happily recommend. Right, um, let's see. Well, let's go to the big daddy. Amphibious Assault, Maneuver from the Sea. This is a really big book. The really, really big book. Osprey 28, but, well, hello Osprey 28 for starters, and, but you see, having crumple zone in the superstructure means you'll be prepared for anything. I do not care. I honestly do not care. There is no reason on earth to make your ship look like that. 
Ooh, this one is fantastic. This is an Amphibious Assault Modern Receipt edited by Tristan Lovering. Um, and frankly, it's, it's just gorgeous. It is absolutely amazing. It's a beautiful book. Um, it's my dream to someday be uh, get a rise of chapter in a book like this. This would be just amazing. Uh, well, let's see. You've got William Lind, Michael Hickey, Robert Foley, Harry Dickinson, Mark Grove, Meryl Bartlett, Stephen Badsey, Christopher Page, Philip Grove, Tim Bembo, Stephen Prince, Colin Prince, Bruce, Colin Bruce, Kenneth Hagen, William Allison, Tristan Lovering, Christopher Tuck, Mark Bentinick, Donald Stoker, Brandon Little, Christopher Tuck, Brandon Little, uh, Mark Mattick, Steve, Stuart Griffin, John Forfar, Michael West, Stephen Weiss, Joseph Alexander, John Farfar, Robin Nealands, Michael Jones, Tim Bean, Michael Hickey, Ian Speller, Tom Hayden, Julian Thompson, and Jeremy Robbins, and of course Julian Thompson again writing conclusion as your list of authors. It is just, there is nothing not covered in here. It goes all the way up to the Al 4 landings in 2003 and starts off with the Constantinople Expeditionary Force of April 1915, i.e. Gallipoli. So it covers pretty much every operation the British, the Soviets and the Americans were involved in from 1915 till 2003. Well, everyone which wasn't Special Forces. This book is amazing. £39 on Amazon, I think, is what Martin, Dar uh, Martin Doherty's just written. Um, it's just... Look at some of these, paint uh, these pictures and look at uh, the summer stuff. It's just crammed full of information. It is... And it's colour-coded. So you can see the green ones are Second World War. So that's World War II. This is pre-World War II. Post-World War II. And you can see the different styles. And you see some of the pictures they have on them. And it's like, you know, you have this lovely picture of HMS Ocean. I think it is, at the back. That's definitely Ocean. And all sorts of things they get up to. And, ooh, the stuff on Inchon and Suez. This is high quality stuff and it was written by the best academics they could get at the time. Originally this book was written for the Royal Navy as an instructional guide. Then it was decided it was so good they turned it into a published book. And it is just uh, very, very cool. Um... Just brought the British Amphibious Assault Ships on Amazon for £9. Oh, that's cool. That is a very cool purchase. But uh, let's look at the Soviet one. Just so I can show you this one in here. Soviet Amphibious Landings in the Black Sea, 1941-44, by Donald Stoker. That is a very good name. And from memory, it's a very good section. Yep. There you go. You have the little Soviet vessels going in. They look more like fishing trawlers being used for amphibious assaults, but hey ho, that's what they're there for. And there are just so many pictures in this one. <clears throat> there we go. There's some details of what the Soviets were getting up to, what they were doing in the various seas. And it's just also what I really like to like about this book and like about all these books. Uh, this chapter is everyone comes with a further reading chapter set or section which lists out other articles and books. You can go and look up for more information on this particular operation. So this one is an excellent book. If you're looking at amphibious warfare and you want a spine book to help you develop your study elsewhere and to move around and sort of as the basis for you going forward, this is the book for you. It's gorgeous.
Mm-hmm. Right. Hi, guy. <laughs> Good lord. The uh, Steam White, the large west lock at Pearl Harbor to stage ships for invasions. Wreckage still remains there from the famous fire in 1944 uh, that burned up six LSTs. Hmm. <laughs> Do I see torpedo boats? <laughs> My response to that might come soon. Right then, let's start off with. Ooh, that was next. Okay, the surprising member of this category, Theodore Roosevelt, the naval operations of the war between Great Britain and the United States, 1812 to 1815. Okay. No, we're not done with the pile of books already. This is just to keep me going while I'm doing the books. I like cake. <laughs> This is one of those books which is a real surprise, okay? Um, I have to admit, you're always taken in to an extent, even though I knew he'd been a naval historian and he's interested in these things, when you hear the name Teddy Roosevelt, you think cowboy president. Actually, what he is is an incredibly educated person. He's incredibly well-read and... This book is incredibly well written. It is still very good to this day. I would be quite happy if I was setting a course to set this as one of the reading books to read. In fact, I did use Stuart King's when I was doing, um, when I was actually teaching this. I would set them, uh, when I was teaching The War of 1812 and sort of that scenario, I would set them Teddy Roosevelt's book and I would set them Andrew Lambert's book. Uh, and I suppose now if I was going to, I'd be setting them um, B.J. Armstrong's um, Small Boats and Daring Men uh, book as well. But uh, this is a very, very good book. It's very interesting. And it's just, it, it's worth it, half of it, because it's just so well written. And Theodore Roosevelt is just such a cool guy. Uh, and when you're reading this book, you sort of really do start to get away, in a way, an idea of how he thinks. And what he thinks about in terms of when he's sending out the Great White Fleet and all these things. When you're looking at just the instructions and he's just sending, you're just hearing the stuff which is recorded officially in history. You get this one view. But when you read this book and you apply it to what he's saying in public and you start to think about what's going on in his mind when he's trying to make these pronouncements, why he's trying to say these things. It gives you a whole different, far more complex image of it. Right then. <laughs> right. <laughs> Main question is Stafford Thompson. What type of cake is it? It's fruit cake. Strub. Doctor, do you think amphibious force operation should be undertaken by dedicated forces? If so, why did the Commonwealth and American forces use army units instead of Marines for D days? Well, we will get into that. We will cover. I will cover the day in a bit, and I'll answer that question when I get onto this book. Okay. When I get onto that book, so oh, I do. I'm gonna do Dunkirk first. I've got two books on Dunkirk, and I like them for different reasons. Right then. <laughs> uh, it, it, this is Robert Jackson's Dunkirk, um, British Evacuation 1940. It has no pictures in it. It is just a reading book. And it is perfect as that. If you want a little book, and this was six ninety nine. UK pounds, apparently $9.95 and US $15.95, so my, now it really shouldn't be expensive. A little book about Dunkirk as a starting guide for your understanding of the Dunkirk evacuation. You cannot go wrong with this Castle Military Classic, or well, Military Paperwax. Um, it's Robert Jackson, it's Dunkirk, 
It's the British Evacuation 1940, and it is just a cool little book to read. And it is... <sighs> what I like about it is when I'm reading it, and it has got some maps. No pictures, but just some maps. It is one of those books which is... Okay, the academic in me should be panning it because of the fact that it hasn't got references, it hasn't got citations, it hasn't got any of those things really in it. It's got a very basic list of sources. But, honestly, and it has got a few notes. Not many, but it's a few notes. Um, it's just good. It's just well written. It's well scripted history. It's well formed. And it's something you can pick up and read in an afternoon and go away with a far better understanding of Dunkirk than you will have had before reading it. And Uh, Bitron, the PBS uh, Ken Burns documentary on the results, Teddy Resort, FDR and Eleanor Resort is very good. There's a nice companion book too. A visit to FDR's Hyde Park is worth a visit. Yeah. Gary, had no idea Roosevelt was a naval historian. Talk about a diverse kill cut. Yes, this is what I mean when I'm talking about Roosevelt. He is a very diverse gentleman in terms of his uh, things. Now... The next book on Dunkirk I have is written by none other than Major General Julian Thompson. Dunkirk Retreat to Victory. And this is a really interesting book because Major General Julian Thompson is, of course, the guy who commanded 3rd Commando Brigade in the Falklands War. So you have someone who has actual experience of commanding amphibious operations in wartime, who has become a very respected historian since then, and is a very good historian, writing a history of an amphibious operation. Now, there's also a book I have up there of his, which is called Small Wars by Julian Thompson. I recommend pretty much anything written by Julian Thompson without reservations. Okay, you have to remember that he is a very, very proud Royal Marine. So the only the, the major bias you have in there is if there are Royal Marines in any of these books, they do usually come off as being supermen. But leaving that to one side, this is an excellent book. And it's got pictures, it's got maps in. It has a lot, a lot of pictures. And I said, how many other books are there written about amphibious operations which are written by a current or at least recent practitioner of amphibious operations looking back in the nicest way this is rare and it's good so if you're interested in dunkirk these are the two books which i would always say you should have read um because there are other books which are bigger other books which have Far more detail, other books which go follow individual units and all sorts of things, and they're all good. They all have their own advantages. But these ones, if you just want to come away with enough of an understanding about Dunkirk, that you can have a mighty jolly argument with anyone about Dunkirk and about the realities of what was going on there, these two books will give you more than enough information for that. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of comments going on here. Marines aren't Superman. Superman? Uh, no, we never tell them they're not Superman, but you know. Right then. So, this one. Okay, it's the strangest one to have in this collection, but it's one of my favourite books. It's Happy Odyssey by Adrian Carton DeWitt. Now, if you remember, I've talked about him a bit because he is the guy who commanded at Namsos, the central campaign in Norway. He got taken prisoner by the Germans. Then when released, went off to Ch was sent to China. 
um, and was sorting out them to fight the war with the Japanese. And basically, he's the man who won't die. He's lost an arm, an eye, and all sorts of things. He is the human personified version of HMS Eskimo. You know, it it, it, it's, it, it is but a scratch. He's just, you know, it's just cool. And this book is just... It is a very good book. It's a lot of fun to read. And there's a lot of stuff in here which you just don't get elsewhere. There are so many... There are so many accounts of World War II I can point to which are very well written, very interesting, autobiographies of World War II, but they are very, very self-serving in that uh, the person involved who's writing it never makes any mistakes, it never does anything wrong. This book is one of the few books I would rate as incredibly high on the honesty ra ra sort of ratio. He is very, very honest about what mistakes he makes and what mistakes he thinks other people make and when other people make good things. He does... He, he, it was interesting to book. He draws a distinction between whether he likes people personally or not, and whether or not they do good, they make good decisions or not. And he's quite honest about I, this person is not someone I got on well with, but they made good decisions, so I'd like to work. I would work with them quite happily, and that's very, very refreshing. So, Happy Odyssey by Adrian Carton Dewitt. I honestly, this book was published in nineteen. Let's see, I have a sinking suspicion. It was first published in 1950. So it's been only published once, as far as I know, and that was 70-odd years ago. But it's worthwhile, if you can get a hold of it. Uh, Danny from Ducks Clark, a new Nelson. Mm -hmm. I muttered, he is who the Marines in Paris aspire to be. Uh, possibly Julian Thompson, possibly. Uh, Bale in Aura, hello, Bale, for starters. Uh, just found out my cat has eaten the bottom right corner of the cover of Corbett, which I had not as I've been reading it at night. I am not happy. <laughs> oh. uh, yes, uh, Adrian Cardua, who they aspire to be, definitely. Um, he is talking about um, Adrian Cardua is unkillable and he is he's just super cool um, look up his Wikipedia profile if you want to but frankly if you want to read about the person who I swear Action Man, G.I. Joe and everyone else must be modelled on it is Adrian Carlton DeWeert and he's just cool he is super cool <sighs> Right then. <laughs> Belenora, is your cat secretly a manian? <laughs> uh, was Narvik, Namsos, Trondheim, and Bergen the four cities in the four alpha? They, they were, yes, they were. Uh, Belenora, quite possibly Daniel Freeman. <laughs> Daniel Freeman, Kindle not three ninety nine is. I'm not sure whether it's this one, which is three ninety nine, or it's one of the Dunkirk ones, which is three ninety nine. But that's a good one to buy if you can. Um, no, no, purely his exploits in Poland would make one person alone noteworthy. Yes, um, this is Carton the Weir is one of those people who, frankly, that there hasn't been a movie made about him. If he'd been American, we'd be dealing with a third or fourth movie about him. It's only the British who don't make movies about our heroes anymore. Um, and frankly, he is a very complicated man, an honest man, but he's also someone who's very, very worried. And here's the thing. The memoirs of Lieutenant General Sir Adrian Carlton DeWitt, with a foreword written by the Right Honourable Winston Churchill. I am glad that my old and valued friend, Lieutenant General Sir Adrian Carlton DeWitt, has written this book. I have known him for many years, and in late war I felt the highest confidence in his judgment services, both in Norway and as my military representative with General Chiang Kai shek. General Carlton DeWitt has been decorated on several occasions for his valour in the field. 
and services to his country, and in 1916 he gained the Victoria Cross. Although repeatedly wounded and suffering from grievous injuries, his whole life has been vigorous, varied and useful. He is a model of chivalry and honour, and I am sure his story will command the interest of all men and women whose hearts are uplifted by the deeds and thoughts of a high-minded and patriotic British officer. Winston S. Churchill. It's just, it's just a cool book. Hmm. Daniel Freeman, it's happy honesty that it's three ninety nine on Kindle. Oh, good lord! If you, it's three ninety nine on Kindle, that is definitely worth it. Um, I don't like to push things, but for three ninety nine on Kindle, that's worth it. Right then. So, my next little random book for a as I'm working for him. Ooh. <laughs> Rob Marsh, are there any initiatives as you're aware of to turn such books into Odyssey on into electronic format? As I said, well, Daniel Freeman has very kindly found um, that on Dunkirk Books as. That is three ninety nine at the Happy Odyssey on Kindle. So, um, and he's found the Julian Thompson's Dunkirk book is um, five ninety nine on Kindle. In Kindle. Ooh. <laughs> I'd love to read Action This Day by Phil Lynn. You, we all would. Um, I have, I've got it. Well, it's somewhere. It was somewhere around me here a few minutes ago. But um. Action This Day is one of those books which I swear has a mind on its own. It goes wandering and I find in places I'm sure I didn't put it. Admittedly, my mum does keep nicking it because she keeps rereading it because um, she, she read my book. Ah, that explains why I got that. Got all the way over there. Um, yeah. Action This Day, Philip Vian's book. Um, she read my book and she came away from it going can i please read about philip vian so i gave her my copy of philip vian's book and um yes it keeps disappearing again since because she goes oh i still haven't read that chapter or i'd like to reread that and think that and i actually <laughs> had the very strange experience of um getting called to a phone call because she was debating with my aunt whether or not Philip Vian deserved another statue. So... <laughs> oh, I don't know. My family. <laughs> I'm reading Action This Day now. Right now. Uh, DGV 40. Yeah, you've got a good read. Right. So, The Greatest Raid of All. By C. Lucas Phillips. And this is about the raid on St. Nazir. Okay. So this is when you have a destroyer, HMS Campbelltown, rammed into Lockgate, uh, rammed into Normandy Dock to stop it basically being able to be used by German battleships. And, well, German, major fleet units. I think specifically the Skarnhorst class they worry about. And it is, it's a great little book. It's really, really quite cool. And again, it's another one of those ones I always try and balance because I know I do recommend some books which are royally massively expensive and some which are very difficult to find. And because I'm a bit of a bibliophile and I do love my books. Um, but I also try and always balance it out with some which are far easier to find and far cheaper. This was six ninety nine. Again, and it's just a cool book. Greatest Road of All by C. E. Lewis. If you're interested in St. Nazir, which is one of those command operations, Jeremy Clarkson did a has done a few very good naval history documentaries. Um, he did PQ seventeen, and he's done the the Greatest Road of All, St. Nazir. And that documentary and this book make an excellent, excellent thing to look at if you want to understand it. Mm. They will worry about Tirpitz, but I think at this time, when this is done, it's more Sean Horst and Eisenhower who are wandering around 
Oh, just bought on Amazon for £1.50. I'm not sure which book you're talking about, but um, those are all good ones. Right, so... Another Gillian Thompson one today. Third Commander Brigade in the Falklands. And I love this thing. It's called No Picnic. And... It's the war from the perspective of the Brigade Commander. It's got some great personal photos he took in his time down there. You really see how useful the landing platform docks are. Probably going to get questions on that in a bit. And I will quite happily answer them. Um, you've got some pictures of the various command teams commanding uh, and organising stuff. Which is quite always quite cool. They're all in their flash. And what's really cool here is you've got the Royal Marine in his uniform. No flash gear. And then you've got the senior na uh, junior naval officers wearing their flash gear. And as they get more senior... The flash gear is less and less prevalent, basically. <laughs> and going, I, I, I'm old enough, frankly, I don't give a flying hoot. So I'm not bothered with it. This one. Uh, oh, such some very cool pictures in here. But no, it is. It's one of those books which you really sort of you get into reading and you enjoy reading. In my case, I really, really do enjoy reading. And what I love is he has an explanation before word and all sorts of things, but author's preface. More. He starts off with some very interesting little poems. And it's just a cool book. It is a very cool book. And it's one of my favourites to read. Alright then. Caution, reaction is day. There is a story about Blackshin and Blackshin Park of the same name for 2002. Sally Vian's book doesn't look to have been republished since 1960. It hasn't been. Um, Yes, Jeremy Clarkson does do some very, very good documentaries. Uh, you know, it's kind of... He has a desire to be very, very thorough in all, most of the work he does. Which is quite good. Um, Amphibious Assault Falklands, Michael Clapp's book. The Battle of St. Carl's Water. And I know I've recommended this several times. But, in various guises. But it is such a good book to read. And it is... The more I think about it, the more I read through it, the more I think the lessons of it need to be remembered. And this book especially true. Because so many of the capabilities which are essential in the Falklands are not capabilities you use that often. So it's very easy to go, oh yes, we don't have... Well, you can't regenerate those capabilities quickly from nothing. You can't even regenerate them that quickly from a seed corn. But you have a better chance if there's a few people there. But the trouble is, if you have a small enough sea corn, it's very easy to cut it. And you have to remember that so much of the capabilities, when you do need them, you really, really need them. And one of the interesting scenarios you have going on at the moment is that Britain has been without carrier strike for 10 years. And now to regenerate carrier strike, we're going to lose the amphibious forces, which were the cornerstone of our global reach for the previous uh, for those 10 years we didn't have carry strikes so it's kind of a case of you can have one or the other you can't have both which is rather silly and short-sighted because you do need both and yes most of the time you might be using small forces but guess what when you need the, when the small forces get in trouble you need to be able to deploy bigger forces and when you need to deploy the bigger forces you really do need the bigger forces Ah, Daniel Freeman, you are doing excellent benefits on me, Daniel, today by checking up the actual figures of the Costis books. I have to admit, I didn't look up because I was worried about how much cost I'd be selling people. Now, uh, uh, Sapphire Thompson, 10 o'clock, any chance Chef Ramsay is related to Admiral Ramsay? Answer on discourse, but haven't 
had time to check. I haven't had time to check either, I have to admit. I am sort of interested in the idea, but I'm not sure. Right then, earlier there was a question, which was from... Uh, okay, Strub. Doctor, do you think amphibious force operations should be undertaken by dedicated forces? If so, why did the Commonwealth and American forces use uh, army units instead of marines for D-Day? Well, for starters, those army units used for D-Day, um, in the nicest way, had gone through months and months of training to do those operations. Two, most of the first wave or zero wave, i.e. the ones going before them, were Royal Navy, Royal Marine, British Army, and US equivalent of commandos who at that time had been conducting amphibious raids. So you're basically talking about the amphibious forces, the tip of the spear being amphibious forces, a specialist amphibious forces, and then the ones behind them in the next waves being trained up to a level of amphibiosity so they can do it. So they weren't, none of them were exactly general, pur general purpose army units, not in the first day or even the first two days. They'd all received some level of training. Now, Beachhead Assault, the story of Royal Navy Commandos in World War II. We hit the beach, down the ramp, but the officer and I got off by jumping over the side. One poor chap was badly wounded and asked to be pulled out of the sea. He was in very bad state, an 88mm shell must have gone off near him. The officer asked, should, we sh should he shoot him? But I said, let's pull him onto uh, to the beach. We left him there, but I don't think he lived long. We had a long walk to meet up the rest of the commandos. Thank God there were sand dunes, which gave us plenty of cover. The chapters in this book are all about what they do, were up to do, up to do, and they what they were doing. Um, you have D-Day one, two, and three, and Normandy the beaches. medals awarded to Royal Navy Commandos, and RNCs are in many, many ways the forgotten unit of World War II's amphibious forces. They were the beach masters, they were beach clearance teams, they were all sorts of things during the operations, and sometimes they did the raids themselves. And what they got up to is illustrated by this. Commander Anthony Colburn, George Cross. Vice Admiral Sir Patrick Bailey. Rear Admiral Edward Guritz. Order of the Buff. Um, Commander H.M. Nicol. Commander Red Reavers Pryor. Com Captain Gregory Smith. Um, Lieutenant Brinkley. Distinguished Service Order. Commander after Havers, Order of the British Empire. And it goes on. It goes on. It goes on. So, quite tightly written text. That is how many honours and awards they get during World War II. There are some pictures in here of them. Some of the stuff they got up to. Uh, they are pretty much involved in almost everything going on. These are the people whose job it is to get on the beach. And once they're on the beach, they don't attacking the enemy, or they might have to fight them off if they attack them. Their job is to turn their backs to the enemy and start directing in landing craft so they avoid our obstacles. Their job is to literally, while under fire, turn their backs on the people who are firing at them and call in landing craft and make sure they get to the place they need to be. And they are some of the most forgotten people in history in terms of what they got up to. If you look at some of the movies and some of the things which have gone on about D-Day, almost at no point 
They show everyone charging up the beach. They show people dying who are standing on the beach and all these sort of things. They do not ever seem to show, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've looked at quite a lot of these videos and these movies and in my time, they do not show the people turning round and actually putting their backs to the enemy and to keep the, the, the things coming in. To keep those, uh, get those landing craft safe. And Jay Richardson, I do agree with your statement, but remember, my little cousins are watching. So, um, yes, I like being alive. <laughs> they are just... It's written by David Lee, and he's done some excellent research, some excellent historical work, and you, the, these things, the things they get up to is just frankly absurd in some respects. And you have to remember at one point uh, there's a very interesting guy called Ian Fleming attached to them, who some of you might have heard of. Um, so, you know, they are get up to a lot of very interesting stuff, and this is a very, very cool book to re uh, to read. Uh, you found, oh, Martin Dorothy, 6 on eBay for Beachhead Assault. It is a very good book. If you can find it... Mm -hmm. Carl Gangon, any book on Operation Husky for Sicily, Operation Dragon Province, in that pile? Carl, seriously. I can get there pretty much any amphibious, any amphibious operation you want. I can just list this book. Um, but no, this book is very, very good. Um, mm. And some of the stuff they got. Actually, this one also has... Um, uh, Sicily, uh, Dragon and Jubilee in from the RNC centers. Because also the other thing is the Royal Navy Commandos, quite a lot of them ended up on what were officially US beaches as well as British beaches. The reason they did was the US didn't have enough of them in the European theatre, so the RN bit teams went across and did them. And helped out. And sometimes they were actually joined on the beaches by guess who? The US Coast Guard. So, on the beaches directing the landing craft, it was mainly Royal Navy, a few US Navy, uh, a few Army and all these things, and even some US Coast Guard. Ooh, okay. Richard Hughes, that's Clark. Glad to hear you in France bath properly. Hmm. Uh, my dad used to always say bath, so I tend to say bath, just to wind him up. And also, winds up my girlfriend a bit. Hey. <laughs> uh, National Museum of the Royal Navy and the British Museum, among other wonderful places, that to buy than Amazon are closed at the moment. That is a sad and annoying thing, but they will open at some point. And frankly, I've actually seen a lot of the work the museum's been doing, things like Tank Fest going on today and all sorts of things. There have been a lot of work going on to try and make these things uh, better while I've got some time to do so. Bad Home, the longest day shows a Beachmaster. Yes, but it, I, yes, it does show a Beachmaster, but it doesn't really show him doing, in the nicest way, doing quite what he'd be doing. Uh, he's walking around with his pacing stick. He's doing, he's making some decisions, but they don't really. They don't quite show the full level of what he is getting involved in. Hmm. Uh, Daniel, Freeman, I did manage to get presents for my dad quickly from a friendly local bookstore recently. West End Lane Books in West Hampton. Oh, cool. Hmm. <clears throat> Jerrison, largest naval invasion ever. Not a single U.S. Marine involved. Eh, you know. Dan from Dexter Park. It is interesting. The Tank Museum has been working very hard. I grew up in North London near Henderson, so I have a soft spot for there. And likewise, I love the British Museum. Yeah, the Tank Museum has been working so hard because the Tank Fest, I think, accounts for about. A third to 40% of their yearly income. 
and tank fest has had to be cancelled and that's critical uh and um you know but it's like things like Duxford are still hoping to have their event on the 18th of September, which they are going to Friday before their World War II 80th anniversary weekend. Um, and, you know, they're having a sort of whole thing going on, which I might be going to just to wandering around. Um, but they've got a whole 40s event and that some of my friends might be going, so I might be going on to that one as well. Colin Murdoch, Colin Douglas Murdoch was a Royal Navy officer who during the Second World War commanded destroyers Somalia and Icarus and acted as beach master of Juno Beach at D-Day landings. Yes. That's the other quite interesting thing. There is a strong link between tribal class destroyers and beach masters in terms of the Royal Navy. We're not quite sure, but apparently the officers do tend to, to have the necessary requirements to be good. If they can do one, they're good in the other, and vice versa. It's 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 quite worrying, though, the links. Um, Daniel Freeman. Uh... <laughs> mm. The clock, book versus brawn, peeps and Henderson for the Bedouin service. Oh, that could be interesting. Let's, we'll have a thing about that. Gallipoli book is six pound on a second hand on Amazon. That's cool. <laughs> oh, the Michelin debate. Done and true, but he was in the film, made me look him up, and while the film doesn't do enough to give him enough credit, at least he is there. I, yeah, okay, I can see that Longest Day pretty much has the only sort of mention of it, really, but the rest don't, and Longest Day I don't really count because there isn't enough to mention, but yeah. Right then, so, that is through the books. And while I'm just generally chatting a bit, I will say thank you to all my subscribers. Because we're now over 4,100, and I never expected to get there. Thank you to all the people who are patrons. Because currently I'm looking at... <laughs> I have got a roughly £400 worth of books in my to order on, uh, in the beginning of July the file. And it's all thanks to the only reason I can afford that. Uh, due to the current issues going on, is thanks to my lovely patrons, so thank you all of you. And, um, yeah, those books will be featuring some of the brew ships later on in, in July and August. And um, thank you to all the people who like and share the videos, because that's been really helping getting more people to like and share them, which is really nice. Mainly because of the bragging rights of my aunt. Donald Trump, uh, have you read James Holland's Normandy 44 Day, the day and the Battle for France? Well, again, yes, it is good. Again, I wouldn't really call... Some of these books are very good, but I was looking at Amphibious Warfare today, and some of these books, they might be about D-Day, but they're very much looking at the land-centric side, and I thought when I'd already got two of those books, I wasn't going to bring in more of them, because I didn't want it to be a continual thing of me going... 
this one's very land centric this one's very land centric this one ignores there's actually landing craft this one treats it as if you're just crossing a normal border border this one treats it as if it's you know nothing you know Jerison. In my wife, she worked at Harrods and she had to go to through Krispy Kreme 101 back when they were exclusive. Turns out Kreme is pronounced Kreme. <laughs> sure, Mac. I heard a story. I wonder if you come across it, Doctor. That the dark amphibious truck was an interest to the military until it saved a frigate or vessel of similar size. Um... There are lots of stories which go around about the duck. It was very interesting to the Royal Na uh, the British from basically the get-go. For the Americans, they were a bit unsure about it. And then there is a story that in the testing days, there was a Corvette having trouble because it was having some issues getting out, um, manoeuvring or something, rudder or something, and a duck came in and helped it with steering. Because it wasn't that far off the beach, and that really showed how strong they were. But you know, mm. that's right. Your your aunt has made this channel success possible. You should maybe really thank her for that. Don't worry, she's getting a nice birthday present in September. But you can do both gloating and thanking. At least in my family. Mm, what can I say? Family bragging rights are very critical at the moment. <laughs> Speaking of the likes of 2282, the doctor has been great per usual. Help the man out. Yeah, thank you. And the press reported it as a truck under development for the military, and the military was like, yes, we are absolutely buying this truck. Well, you see, they were right, because it was under development for the British, as I understand it, from one, of, from one of the books I read. But the thing is, I've read a few books which go both ways, and I haven't really done that much digging, but I think it will, the story is, like a fair number of things in World War II, Britain industry was under strain of supplying existing equipment. So they didn't have the capacity to develop new equipment at the, as, at the time as they were bulking up for war. So Britain went and tried with America. And I always seem to remember the, the manufacturers connected some way to the Higgins boat people. And it basically crossed pollinates. And then 19... This is one reason why the Americans have such an advantage in 1941. You know, 1941, 42... Yay! You know, when war starts uh, in 1942, they're going, yes, we're in. We've got all this wonderful equipment. Well, a good chunk of that equipment they have has been paid for because Britain's already been in war for the last three years and has been basically getting them to develop it. So it does help. But the Americans do a huge contribution. So you see, you, you've got to... How may I put it? I do not like it, as I said in the book the other day, uh, the video the other day, which was the thank you video for reaching 4,000. I do not see it necessary that you need to to build one thing up and to say how important one thing's involvement was, or one ship, or one nation's etc. in war, means you have to, or you are, by implication, saying others were less involved or less important. There is no zero sums game. Just because one thing's important doesn't mean something else is immediately less important. There can be lots of critical factors in having an, an having an outcome, especially the outcome it way and where where it happens. Jerison, go hide, but you could be right. Um, Dust Clark, just read White Flag by Lord Ashcroft in his workshop. Um, okay. It's an interesting, uh, you see, it's interesting in that I see a lot of problems in the UK defence, but I don't see necessarily the civil service 
in some sort of vast majority of the Ministry of Defence as being a problem. Individuals, possibly. But the vast majority are very hard-working, very committed to UK defence, as are the vast majority of the military service personnel. I just... That I just think that department is particularly easy for the Treasury to set against itself. I do not know why they have managed to make themselves so easy for that. Thomas Rottweiler, your dad is a very brave guy. If he went in on D-Day plus one dry, with the signals group repairing telephone lines, driving the truck, that is not a safe job. That was a plummet scary job because you were target number one. Signals intelligence was critical. Um, so yes. John Luke, I watched China in bilge pumps. Uh, one thing I have, uh, I think that got missed is the Chinese idea of face and saving face. Having lived in China, I found saving face is the first priority. Yes, it is. It is. It often is. Quite disturbing how obsessed they can get with that. John Luke, is that local knowledge something lacking today in navies in the West and elsewhere? Sorry for the question. I would say local knowledge has become a bit of a problem. Um, when I was putting together my dream navy, I was basically assigning forces which were presence in regions, but also present there so that you could build up local knowledge again. You could reconnect in the way you had. The idea is increasingly come, come that you can fly in, that you can basically be a sort of helicopter senior officer appear, make a friend immediately, and we can work together. You need a long-term commitment to actually build up a proper relationship. And that's the problem. We don't have the forces to do that. We don't have the forces based around the world that can do that. It's one of the reasons why one of the people who commented suggested that we use the River B freeze I was pointing out, rather than Type 31, so presence mission. I went... That doesn't really work. Because the quality of what you show up with matters. And the Type 31 is enough quality that it matters. And it will be interesting for them. So yes. Local knowledge is lacking. Vice Admiral Nelson. A retired paratroop once star general once told me that building up a new brigade takes 10 years. How long does it take to renew Naval Branch, EV Carrier Amphibious Assault? Five years. Well, you'd be talking, if you were designing from cold, let's say landing platform docks with no existing experience, and after everyone had left the service, you'd be talking, who'd ever operated them, you'd be talking, even with allies' help, 10 to 15 years to probably get a good design and get it built. Then you'd probably be talking about another 10 to 15 years to build up your amphibious arm to the point at which you could do it. This is under peacetime conditions where you're not accepting a humongous risk. That's the thing. In World War II, it could be done a lot quicker, but you were expecting you were accepting far higher levels of risk than we would normally because it was a world war. So when people turn around and go, but we managed to do this so quickly in a World War scenario, I go, yes, but we're accepting a level of risk which we wouldn't accept it currently. We would accept it because we're in a World War. And the point is also this. We're talking about company landing teams, which is great. Fine. But we're not properly investing to do what the company landing teams need to do. Besides, if we're going to really go for company landing teams, you need the US Marine Corps APC program. You do. You need those eight wheelers, which can get you in and out and get you give you organic movement. You do not want to be dependent upon helicopters if you are a company landing force. You need a organic your own organic fire base. You need uh, your own organic movement. You need all these things. Helicopters are nice for getting recon people in, for getting them in and out quickly. But you need those vehicles. And. Um, Honestly, if you end up in a South China Sea scenario, etc., having a the, having a heavier force that you're able to sort of mount a larger group of companies, i.e., we're talking a commando 
and its entire force and attachments, so we're talking a section, a, a battle group, that's useful because you can penny packet your companies around if that's where you operate or operate as a group. And being able to bring in several of those group things together to operate as a brigade, that is an absolutely amazing function when you need to do something big. When you need to reinforce Norway against perhaps a Russian invasion or, you know, a fight up in the Arctic, in the Arctic or the Antarctic. When you possibly potentially need to do something down to reinforce the Falklands after the air bridge has been blocked or all sorts of options. Being able to land a brigade in a chunk ready to fight. And this is the different point. Amphibious forces are trained to land and be able to fight straight away. They're not an army formation which would normally be landed, take a day or so to organise themselves, constitute themselves, put themselves in order, and then go into the fight. They have to land and fight straight away. That is what makes them amphibious forces. That is what makes them work. That is complicated. Jeff Beeler, what does the US Marine Corps do? Um... A lot. They've already got the big stuff. Okay, the big equipment's already being bought and it's not going to be got rid of anytime soon. So they can afford to be as disparaging about it as they like to get the small stuff. But they've been talking about a mixed flotilla for years. And this is what the US Marine Corps is really moving towards. It's a mixed force of landing ships. It's not they don't want the big landing ships anymore. It's that they want the small ones. And to make the case for the small ones, they need to almost make the case negatively in a way against the big ones. Because they put so much effort into making the case for the big ones. Trent Talanko, would it be possible to get a list of books reviewed and times in your Brew, Brew Ships YouTube texts? Um, there is a list of the books reviewed down below in the big thing of this book. Um, times, I don't think I've put that in yet, but I will probably. I'll try and work that out. I'll try and go back to the old ones as well once the book's in and everything's in. Strub, Doctor, why did the Allies choose Normandy over invading southern France first? Makes Germany commit to the south, then land in Normandy. Uh, logistics. Logistics. And the fact is, there was the idea you could land in Norway and Normandy and march straight to Germany. Rather than trying to fight all your way up. Seth Thompson, uh, Dustin Clark, have James and Drax seen the BCG and did their heads explode? Also, were you surprised you didn't have a modern tribal in your... Uh, was surprised you didn't have a modern tribal in your fleet? Well, uh, they haven't seen the BCG, but I've almost finished it. It's very interesting. I've enjoyed it. And I'm making some comments, and I'm going to send it back to you soon. And I will pass it on to them if you fancy. Also, was uh, as for the having the modern tribal in your fleet, as I've... S if you buy my book... In when it comes out theoretically in December, that will be explained then. I'm going to leave it for the book. <sighs> Seth Thompson was a great 4K thank you video. Well, it's a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. So, Jairus is having awesome. My great uncle destroyed 50 ME 109s during World War II. He was the worst mechanic in the Luftwaffe. <laughs> oh, good lord. That's a good joke, though. See what? A US Army had Patton and Eisenhower in Europe for years building the graveyards with other officers to learn the countryside. Patton knew France and Germany very well. Yep. Night Heron Production. What ship today is the best for presence, in your opinion? I imagine Kirill's would rate pretty highly. Also, hello and hello. Well, I like the Nudramusen class, actually, for presence. But um, the Ivor Hilsfeld is pretty good. The Danish ones. The Danish do build good presence ships. Because presence is about having the ability to forward deploy the ship. And having it being on board so it can be a presence. And that's the thing. Having a big, beautiful ship and only one of them doesn't really give you presence because you can't have a continued forward presence anywhere. Having good quality ships that are easy enough to maintain, you can have them forward. That gives you presence. Right. 
Back in a second, someone's just calling me. I wonder where it's gone. Sorry about that. I was back. I just had a question that only I could apparently answer. Yeah. That's strange. Right. Back. Let's see. No oh, migration's coming. Let's, let's, let's have a look. Um, so, do you think the US Marine Corps is going too, by, too far by removing the M1 tank from its forces? Not necessarily. The M1, if you need a tank, you need a tank. But I think they can probably cover for it with the other things they have. As long as they have enough artillery, they have enough anti-tank weapons, they have enough other mobility units, i.e. their APCs, etc., then they can probably adapt. I think what you're seeing is the US Marines are moving towards what's a sort of an amphibious ca like, um, cavalry approach rather than amphibious armour approach. Um... Uh, Martin Zarity, unfortunately, one of the biggest faults at the moment is, is the RN don't have anyone in the House of Commons fighting their corner. The Army and RAF have and have been seen publicly fighting for, well, Johnny Mercer, Penny Mordaunt have both done a fairly good job for Portsmouth and Plymouth. Penny Mordaunt, of course, is Royal Navy Reserves and does do things occasionally. Um, there's a few others who wander around and try and make their cases. So there are a few people involved. Sure, Matt, the US Marine Corps do a lot of stuff, and then, the, including designing unit tracks, and they're not buying them. Yeah, that's because they keep designing equipment and then realising they're going to be fighting a slightly different war. The book is pretty much done. All the pictures are there. I'm just polishing out the references. 
Um, I found a couple which I'd actually written in shorthand and still turned to. It's going to find a way. When I don't, for, to, I haven't written a, the reference out in longhand, I just use my own shorthand. I leave it in red in the document. And these had somehow managed to be turned to black, so I missed them. But it's good to check it all. It's all there, done. It's ready to go. It's actually being with the publisher and come back and being with the publisher and come back. But it's good. And what's a good book to read about Royal Navy Cruisers design and development? Freeman's. Um, it's the old story, really. Uh, let's see. There we go. This one. Norman Freeman's. British Cruisers. Uh, it's you know, the trouble is, it's the biggest and it's the best. It's not brilliant and not perfect, but it's better than everything else on the options. Ah, okay. John Luke, what is the pro and con uh, internationally uh, of allowing the plan to develop naval base outside the China, China Seas? In a war, is it. Is it a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can see in the Chinese Navy, or a major problem? Well, in initial phases, it's a major problem. But once you, if you manage to track those forces down and destroy them, it becomes a major weakness, because they've got to supply them, they've got to try and keep them going. But the thing is, in peacetime, it helps them build up a presence and build up allies. And that can be more of a problem for wartime than anything else. Tony Penfold, Ref 4K video. Um, where can you post our own all time ideas? Was thinking of my own PowerPoint patron? If you want, I'll set up a channel in Patreon which is dedicated in, in Discord. Again, a link to Discord is down below for your own ideas for what I'm calling dream fleet rather than fantasy fleets. Um, happy to do that if that would work. Jeff Beeland, the UK invaded the Falklands from based on the other side of the world. That thing about that. Yeah, it's logistics. But it's also having that capability there. This is the thing, when we're talking about LPDs, everyone gets wrapped up in terms of the number of troops they carry, and oh, they can carry this big population. It's the sheer logistics they can carry. Okay? It's the landing craft. It's the command facilities. It's so many different capabilities bowled up into one ship. That is what you're building. When you build an LHD, you're basically taking that and you're going, right, we're going to add a flight deck and a hangar on top of it. This is the massive thing you're talking about. And so when you talk about getting rid of these things, you are saying we don't need logistics. We don't need command control. We don't need all these things of the level of which you have got in those facilities. UK defence is constantly robbing Peter to play pool now. A shocking set of affairs. Martin Dorothy. Honestly, it's been like that for a very long time. We're talking even prior to World War II. Henderson was doing some juggling. In the beginning of his time in the, as for the Sea Lord. 1933 to 35-ish. 35 35-ish 35 onwards, they start to open up the taps a bit. So he doesn't have to do the juggling anymore. So much... Trouble is, the Royal Marines leave everything to the army in terms of vehicles. They have some BV 206s and Vikings. And no, is it 206s or just something else? They're the newer version, aren't they? And they, they, they still have. They're good if you're fighting in snow. Bad home. We're at a disturbing level of lack of Admiral Henderson. I managed to mention him a couple of seconds ago.
God. Yep. Run. Jonic, how useful a ship type is the Abyssal class? Um, is its design and easily adaptable to other rules? I retain the ship's uh, ship stand flex and adding flight decks are for UAV wing. Could be a deadly combination. It could be a deadly combination. It's a, it's a fairly flexible design, but honestly, it's a flexible design for a nation. It's going to sound like Absent class looks great until you're a nation which goes right in. So does it have the aviation facilities of a carrier or a full flight deck? No. So we are those nations which can afford that can have far more UAVs for that. Does it have the capabilities of um, an amphibious assault ship, an LPD? No. So those nations can afford that? Have that. Does it have the uh, capabilities of a destroyer? No. So those nations which can afford that? Have that. Basically, it's one of those ship designs which looks great because it's a 60% solution for lots of different jobs. But the trouble is for the major nations and the major nations which are going to build level equipment are going to build a dozen or so of these things. That doesn't really matter. It doesn't save anything because the level they'd have to go for them to have a utility out of that vessel would be so much more that it would drive up its cost anyway. Airmen, do you think Germany will ever name pre uh, ships after pre World War One officers again, such as Sean Orson, Eisenhower, Blucher, and Malk, or have those names been tainted by association with Nazis? I'm honestly not sure. There was a Graf Spey post World War Two. Paul Johnson, the clock. How much do you think the defense budget is short by, or do you think it's just a case of a lot of waste? There is a bit of waste. Most of the waste is actually caused by very senior people cheap changing their minds about things. If you just build what you plan to build, it'd be amazing how cost effective that would be, rather than changing your mind and going, oh, we'd like to add this in, we'd like to add that in, we'd like you to have this capability. We think we're going to have it this type, but no, no, we'll change back to the type we originally was. Um, these sort of things. It, 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 you'd be amazed at how much more efficient it would. If they hadn't paid the um, builders not to build the carriers, we could have probably afforded a third carrier for the cost of the money it was spent on it. Uh, but leaving that to one side, I think it does need to. I think it should rise a little bit. But I'm, I wouldn't like to say I can. I can make an assessment for the navy of how much I'd want it to rise to cover the dream of the dream fleet, roughly. Um, but. Working out a cost for the other services. I seem to remember that it's not quite getting 2% of GDP. And the UK National Defence Association, as they used to be called, uh, I, I forget their current name, um, estimated it as needing to be about 3% of GDP. So that would be about a 50% increase in defence spending, which would take it to around about... Um, uh, 60, 70 billion a year. Which I could sort of see. Lanka, have you reviewed Freedman's UK and US amphibious ships and craft? I was... Here late. No, I haven't. Um, I haven't actually got that book anywhere visible to me. That's the interesting thing. I have read it, and I've got it somewhere in my books. But it's... Where is it? I'll have to go hunting that. It's managed to go moving. I do have some books which do like to move, I swear. Um... Okay. Uh, Jerison, we need to get on the, the, the defense budget back to the imperial fifty one percent of GDP. 
I don't think it was ever actually 51% of GDP. I don't think there's lots of people who talk about different things about what the defense budget was. I think it was usually about 5 to 6% at maximum. And it, it usually kept a less, a lesser than. That's one reason the Royal Navy spent the, really spent the money on the Navy, was it was better to spend it on the Navy. It was cheaper than spending on the Army. Uh, Badham, what the Albertson design might be truly great at and has been used as is a command ship of a small force or a modern day diplomatic cruiser. Uh... Yeah, but the thing is, if you have carriers, if you have other things, you don't use it as such. And if you have big enough destroyers, it, it could be, but it's for small navies. And when I say small navies, I don't mean Britain, I don't mean France, uh, possibly Germany, but more likely <coughs> New Zealand. New Zealand could definitely benefit from something like the Abyssal class. Sure, Mac, it's just that I'm worried the Marines will deploy to Africa and realise that having some tanks would be really nice at the moment. Yeah, that worries me. There are lots of scenarios which worry me. I think they're building too much of one scenario in a mind, and they don't think about the general scenarios enough because it's too expensive to. Uh, UK National Defence Association sounds like a far right group. They really weren't, Jay Richardson. They really, really weren't. They were. They've ch they've changed the name a couple of times. They are really, um, really quite nice. And uh, uh, mostly the former armed forces people who are just trying to get together to try and get some decent funding for defence. John Luke, Arsenal ships. Curious. It seems to be a vision of a next general primary fleet unit. But seems to be potentially an over-engineered ship that may fall short of it in potential value and could easily be knocked out. It's Arsenal ship is an interesting concept, basically. Arsenal ships have been around as a concept since basically when missiles first appeared. Very simple idea. Turn from the all big gun ship to the all missile ship, and ooh, an Arsenal ship comes into being. <laughs> Trouble is the practicality of building it. And the sheer quantity of missiles you need and other things have turned to mitigate against it. But I say that myself, I could see a scenario where a modern version of an Arsenal ship, i.e. a quick conversion of a container ship, etc., could a small enough container ship could be pursued. Especially if you wanted to provide extra strike or surface to air firepower for your uh, your naval battle group Evan, since you mentioned Graspe, should he have dispatched all of his light cruisers for commerce racing instead of keeping most of them with his armor cruisers Well, one dispatch was very successful. Dispatching them all would have made the job far more difficult for the British to deal with them, but it would also made his own force far, far more difficult to manage and secure and keep going. And he needed those ships for reconnaissance and other things in order to find his path. So ultimately, I think he probably did the best decision he could make in a bad situation. He didn't really have any easy or any right answers, and he was doing the best he could. I think he probably did the right one under those circumstances for him. Doctor, after China, who is the Iron's next peer threat? Mm, probably Russia. But also, let's be honest, there's Iran in there. There are all sorts of issues, potentially in South America. It all depends on how... Let's put it this way. Today's friends can be tomorrow's enemies. Okay? Traditionally, Britain allied with Prussia 
are Germany against France. Traditionally. We had been instrumental in creating Germany and supporting its creation. That's what Britain were. We were also instrumental in the creation of Italy as a unified nation. Because they were our friends. But also, at other times, we have fought Italy. We have fought Germany. Now, I'm not saying this is anything likely to happen in the current generation of politics. I don't know. But you buy a warship, it will be in service often for 20, 30 years. And five minutes can be a long time in politics. Five days can be a long time in international relations. Five months, five years, 25 years. That's a long time. So you have to, in this way, you cannot spend your whole life thinking, I'm only going to prepare for what is my next peer threat, because that will mean you'll end up in trouble. Half the trouble the British had in the Falkland Islands was because the Argentinians used Western missiles. And all the British systems were designed around defeating Soviet missiles. Jeff Beeler, old fact of the day. After D-Day, the Royal Marines in Central, in Central Howitzer equipped tanks provided fire support for the 6th Airborne Division, the Royal Artillery, and then Canada took over the role. Hmm. Dana Freeman, Doctor, so why can't the US Army provide the tanks and rely on the US and an army for most artillery support, or tanks? I'm not saying don't have them, just let the army pay for them. It's more a case of, in the nicest way, the army's going to have its own commitments. That's the problem, if you need the armor off the army. You're going to have to find another way to sort it. Um, Kevin Tagler, I assume Arsenal ships have nothing to do with the EPL Arsenal team. No, they don't. The thing is also, Dana Free was bringing it up, is 60 tons of tank. So it's a quite heavy thing to carry in your ships. Mm-hmm. Vision, for me, the best Arsenal ship is a convert just a SSBN converted to an SSGN, like your higher class SSGNs. Uh, for example, for UK, you could build more dreadnought class submarines as SSGNs. Please look at my 4,000 uh, 4K video. <laughs> That's basically what I've said. Kevin Taggart, please, no more wars between the French and England and the UK. It depends. Honestly, if they start hogging a chocolate supply or something like that, I'll be leaving the invasion. But no, short of that, we're, we're fine. But they stop off my supply of chocolate. Yeah, things are over at that point. If Iron prepares to face the dire human threats of the USN, the Iron will be able to handle a lot of other things. That's part of the point. You Sometimes you uh, prepare to fight whoever the most powerful nation in the world is. The fight whoever they are friends. Your friends. Um, yeah. Um, Aeon one, f Aeon ten thousand and three. I can never understand that they left the LST Newsport concept for the hovercraft concept. It must double the time to get ready at the beach. Uh, not really, because you bring everything with you. You literally bring everything. That's the LST ones, and they've got some pretty cool designs. Remember, these designs are coming mainly from an Australian firm, which have been producing some very, very good concept ideas and some very good ships in the merchant chart, in the civilian sphere, which have been showing this capability. And you're now looking and going, well, I wouldn't mind them, actually. They could be quite darn useful. I wouldn't mind Britain having a couple of them. Okay, Dr. Lott, apart from enthusiasm, passion and knowledge for the subject, what were the other reasons behind your book? 
it seemed good at the time. Now, I wanted to do a book about escorts and bring it together because it seems to me that a lot of stuff with escort design, destroyers especially, is forgotten when it comes to most of their life. Angus the son of Scotland leaves the UK, France is into new alliance with Scotland, Iron Brew is embargoed on England. War. That would not be war, that would be... <laughs> in the nicest way, you cut off our Iron Brew, you have to face me in drag on very pissed off terms. <laughs> Sometimes it talks about URARV. Uh... I think I'm talking unmanned land vehicle, ULV. And yes. That is the other option. And if you find in the nicest way, I've been looking at this, but especially the APC project and the boxer project. If you could make an unmanned version of a boxer vehicle or equivalent APC from the US Marine Corps and equip it with an auto-loading gun and control it from a normal APC, well, the reason you have all the armor on a regular tank is because you don't want the people to die when they're doing the things. But you could equip this with enough armor and enough equipment, especially considering you wouldn't need all the human space for it, for it to be survivable enough that you don't mind. And I do remember reading a book which had a basically an APC, an eight wheeler, with two eight wheeler buddies, which were unmanned, and they were pretty much light tanks armed with very fast firing weapons, which had hypersonic darts in them. Which you could actually make quite easily. That's the thing. If you were using a, uh, the correct type of propellant, uh, you could make a dart which would go definitely very, very supersonic, if not hypersonic. Um, and that would really not be a fun thing for a ship, uh, for a tank to try and any vehicle to take on. Mm. Richard Hughes, what are the greatest strengths of the Pe People's Liberation Army? Mass. Sheer quantity. They have mostly equipment which we would consider 80 to 85% of what our equipment is in terms of capability, although it does look more than it's 80-85% probably. Uh, but they have a lot of it. And that matters. Kevin Dagnan and McTaggart, don't have to worry about minefields in hovercraft. Yes, you do. Hovercraft are not necessarily going to skip over a minefield. Trust me, if they did, then you would have seen a lot of them used in Afghanistan because there's a lot of off-the-shelf hovercraft available. Um, John Luke, do we often overlook simple solutions uh, uh, presently in ship to ship warfare? Yes, we do. We do. Do a Michael go out biography next? I'm working on that, but it won't be next, Jeff Beeler. Emin, I read a comment before that the reason Britain supported the Italian unification was because it would remove Naples. Merchant fleet, which was competing with Britain's. Is that true? No, because let's be honest, uh, why would a unification to make a nation larger reduce its merchant fleet? Actually increases it, and it combines it with Venice's and Genoa's.
John Luke, is Stealth still the future, or will, in, in the end, it fall back to overwhelmingly fallacy and survivability, and self become a special mission deployable asset? I, look, if you're talking about stealth features, as in the shaping of hull and superstructure, I think that's here to stay. Do I think stealth is going to be the be-all and end-all? No. But if you consider, surprise has always been a tactic in warfare. You always try and achieve as much surprise as you can. So, you know, it's going to be there, but... Bannum, has the British diplomatic corps missed a weapon in the missions to the East? Imagine they introduced Iron Brew to Saudi Arabia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and others. I think they should be trying it. Sorry, Dr. Cruise missiles cost a lot. Why Navy is not just exploring better ways of dropping dumb bombs or a wing-mounted 30mm? Because wing-mounted 30mm doesn't do as much damage to an enemy ship as you'd like, and dumb bombs... Whilst that might have been the plan for the Svaldov class uh, cruisers in the 1950s, I'm not sure it's a plan for modern warship engagements. I have a feeling the if you're trying to get in dumb bomb range, then you're going to get fairly shredded. Uh, lessons of the Falklands War were that it was A, not really great, and B, whilst they did achieve some successes, uh, the lessons learnt meant that warships rearmed. Because uh, lots of things have been stripped off warships prior to the Falklands War in the Missile Age, because they were no longer advanced. Post-Falklands War, a lot of things got added back. Now, Thompson, Doug Clark, I don't think the world will be ready if you and I got a budget and a building yard. No, but it could be fun. Captain, I take issue with Afghanistan. Is it is landlocked? Thus, the Marines couldn't use their hovercrafts. I think hovercrafts are good for beach assaults. The U.S. Marine Corps might not be able to use. You're thinking about the huge LCACs, but there are lots of smaller hovercraft. And again, if you're talking about beach assaults in Iraq, you have to clear the minefields before you send in the hovercraft, before you send landing craft. In a nice way, it doesn't matter what you're using, you still don't want your your uh, anything going over it, really. A hovercraft has a great big skirt, which if it's damaged, it doesn't manage to get up and inflate, and you definitely don't want having that trouble over water, you tend to have issues. Um, even on, over land, there are issues in a nice way where it, if you get problems with the skirt, if you get problems with the underside of the hovercraft, it's... Yeah, minefield is not good. They're not good with mines, okay? Hovercraft and mines are not a good idea. Landing craft and mines are not a good idea. Anything and mines is really not a good idea. And look up the Royal Marines little landing craft and you'll see that they could quite easily have been air portable and put into Afghanistan if they were a good idea for dealing with mines. Sorry to be quite so emphatic on it, Kevin, but it's just, no, mines, hovercraft do not have some magical ability when it comes to mines. They get damaged just the same, in fact, they get damaged worse in some respects. The Republic of Korea Marine Corps uses the Israeli Spike missile family. Would it be a match for our own commandos? Um, it would certainly be a fun what system to have. Night Heron Production. Odd question. H4 Hercules Spruce Goose, had it been proven, then delivered en masse, what effect would it have had, given its... Objective of flying above the wolf packs. Uh, that could have been a lot of, lot of problems for everyone. Could have been interesting. Could have been a lot of fun. Doctor a Scrub. Well, Doctor, why did post World War Two did flags of convenience and merchant fleets over the major nations? Um, tax issues. Flags of convenience tend to be lower tax regimes. 
Jeff Beeler, do the Romains have any vehicles other than the BB 202s? They have a few light vehicles. They have nothing really major, though. Sorry, but I was thinking about dumb bombs for land strike missions. But we, Strub, uh, they are used. But honestly, with usually with laser guide and things like that put on, so they can get where they need to go, but you know. It's the, it's the scenario. If you're using those and you do want to use those, they do make things cheaper, but you have to use quite a few of them. And even then, it's, you know, that's your aircraft carrier, and that's the reason it's there, because that's cheaper than the missiles. The loft and aircraft over there with eight of them, and then it comes back, rearms, and has to go back again. Kevin, I just thought the skirt lowered the PSI. Actually, no. Um, it lowers the ground pressure, so it's going around. But it also creates a lot of vibrations in the soil because of the way the air works on, you know, creating the air pressure which it floats on. So it's going to sound strange. It What it does is it, how do I put this? As it goes across, yes, you don't have the weight being pressed down on the mines, but you have vibrations which can still set off the mines. So it, it, it's just not a good idea. And then if an anti-personnel mine goes off, your skirt can get damaged and deflated. Then the thing lands, and that's a huge lump coming down. And if the it hasn't already set off the anti-tank mines, that will set off the anti-tank mines, and that's a big boom. And it's got a nice flat or similar underside. So, um, yeah, just not a good idea. Minefields are just not good. There's nothing really which has a good chance for them. Okay, Night Heron Productions, I think you've got another two part question. Um, if it gets delivered by 42 to 43, um, if you did have the Spruce Goose delivered by 42 43, that does make an interesting thing. I think it probably gets used by a high value, low. Um, High value, low density, uh, sort of high value small goods movement more than anti submarine warfare, but it could well get used for that as well. John, Luke, what do you think about Russian shipbuilding? They always try to go bigger, uh, i.e., leader classics. Would a Junicol Navy suit them best, ramping up their existing corvette force more firepower? They always talk about going bigger. Actually, the moment they're building the Krivak 4, or the Krivak. Well, let's put it this way. So, Krivax 1 and 2 were the Soviet navies. Now the Russian navies. Uh, Krivax 3s were the Ministry of Interior slash KBG, so GB slash who knows what border force ones. They were ones which actually had helicopters on them. And a slightly more conventional layout. Then there are the Talwar class, which are the Indian Navy ones, which I call the Krivax 4s. And then there's the new ships they're building, Admiral Grigirich. I'm not sure, I think I'm getting it wrong, which are the Kira 5s, and um, they're all roughly, they've grown a bit, but you know, it's not massive. What they're actually building is a very competent, very interesting, what I would call light blue water navy. What they're talking about is a deep blue water navy. And you've got to remember that they talk a big game, but that's part of the national status. What are they actually building? Actually building LHDs. They're actually building these these frigates. So yeah, I do think you're onto the right thing, but I don't. I think they're building a Junicol Plus Navy, really. With enough of a naval uh, global strike force to cause trouble if they wanted to. At some point, I, I am going to be doing next next Sunday is superpowers, and by that I mean talking about Soviet versus American ones. And um, yeah, that one's going to be an interesting discussion. We're going to probably go into modern Russia, China, America. What well, makes a superpower a superpower?
Ah, oh, Kamlan Gasberg, Kirik at five, Admiral Givorovich. So I was right. That's good. Um. My hero reaction, contributing, contributing to the hovercraft debate, could uh, currently transpiring. Would an Anaracta plan um, ground effect aircraft be a good alternative? Incredibly expensive. Um, could be interesting. But, no. I don't, I don't really think so. It's viable for modern operations at the moment. They are the sort of things which, if they get any damage, they're going to have a lot of problems. Uh, Jeff Wheeler, how much does 3rd Commando Brigade work with 16th Assault, Air Assault on joint high, mo high mobility operations? They theorise with them a lot, and if you consider some of the things which happened in Africa a few years ago, I think in uh, Sierra Leone, you have paras and their marines showing up very quickly. Paras are inserted by aircraft, and the marines turn up. Um, to reinforce and make sure it's well understood what the British intention is going on in there. Uh, that's the theory, you know, in nice way. And that works best, actually. You see, here's a strange thing. I support having those small ships with a company or so sized operations group on them. And as I put in my own... Uh, my own dream fleet. I would like a few of them to have them positioned around the world. I just don't see them as replacing the LPDs, but I see them as having there as a sort of on-call reaction force. You can fly out the paratroops, a uh, paratroop regiment a, a, a company there. You can have this local marine company turn up with heavy equipment, necessary heavy equipment and other stuff they need to score. So you've got two companies there which is a significant capability, a presence, a significant tripwire, and that will buy you time, hopefully, to deploy the full brigade. And that's the thing. It's about buying you time and presence so you can deter conflict. You turn up quick enough with enough force that you can deter the conflict. But you can only do that deterrent if you have the big hammer coming. You can only deter with a little hammer. Let's be honest. I actually have some props here, which I can use to make this point, if I can find them. This is my rapid reaction forces. It's a lovely little hammer, which is also a screwdriver. Many different types of screwdrivers. It's lovely. It's my multi-tool. It's very, very cool and goes down even more to a very cute little one. Right on. So. This is the force. And builds up. These are my little rapid reaction forces. They are my forward deployed company. They are my forward deployed, my rapid reaction parachute company. These things. It's a lovely little hammer. But it doesn't take the place of this thing. This will do many, many jobs. But when this won't do, this does do it. And this does everything. So, my little forward deployed force is this. It's available. I can carry it in my car, all sorts of places. I won't get into too much trouble if someone finds it in my car. This, if I'm carrying it in my car, I better be taking it somewhere for a reason. Now, by the way, I have these up here because I've been doing some work on my model railway, so that I don't normally have hammers in this room. They normally live in the garage, hence it looks like this. But this is going to do the damage. So this is my amphibious... Well, let's put it this way. Let's say this is my amphibious uh, rapid reaction battle group, which is a commando, 
plus enhancement centered on an LHD and an LSL. Okay, this is the force which, if I need to, turns up and is the whack of the amphibious orbit involvement. This is the little forward deployed force. And let's say I have real trouble. I have a drill, which is my carrier battle group. So this is a full tool set, a full tool kit, uh, because you've got your little screwdriver, your small forces, your special forces, your forward deployed forces, your light little things. You've got your heavy brigade, your riot squad, your amphibious task group. And you've got your drill, which will get out any of the annoying problems, which is your carrier battle group. Okay? You don't go... Right then, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this, keep this and this. Because this can't replace this. And this can't replace this. But honestly, it's very expensive to walk everywhere with this versus this. And when I need this, this won't do. And when I need this, this won't do. That's it. That is what we're talking about when we're talking about these groups. You know, you're looking at for an explanation of what is your carrier force for? What is your amphibious force for? What do you have the forward deployed forces for? Well, they're a balanced approach and you need them all in order to have an effective force. Um, Trent Tanker, odd for are the LSS designs a modern reimagining of the OSN World War II APD? No. They just aren't. They're more a sort of landing ship gantry. Possibly. Go look through the landing craft videos. Um, there are a couple which they're kind of similar to. Shrub, do you know, Doctor, do you know anything about the USS Jones Act? It's not the one which um, means everything has to go on American flagships or something. It's how the US tried to keep their merchant marine quite strong and stop the role of the British, Mar British, Mar uh, British maritime you know, forces basically taking over everything. Okay. Jeff Beeler, what are the Royal Marines, Dutch Marines, French Marines, US Marine Corps Marines possibly used in Europe? Uh, the Dutch Marines, Royal Marines and US Marine Corps are all heading up to Norway and the Scandinavian countries. I think the French Italian Marines are used to reinforce Greece and possibly the islands on the southern flank. So they all they have their they all have their purposes. And there's a lot of stuff in the Baltic. There's a lot of uh, basically Northern Europe front, the Scandinavian regions. There is a lot of work for Marines in those areas. If you consider that at one point the British were expecting that logistics would be completely paralysed and landing craft would be providing up to 60 to 70 percent of mobility logistics in any Norwegian scenario, which is why they were so prepared to use a landing craft and LSLs in the Falklands, because they've been practicing it in Norway for years. So if you consider that logistics movement in Falklands, that's based on what they're planning on doing in, in Norway because they don't think they're going to have ports because they think the, Sovi the Soviets or Russia would destroy the port facilities because they know where they are.
Jeff Beeler, Saudi Yassin has taken delivery of cargo sprays. What is the likelihood of the RN ever getting any, especially tankers? Very, very unlikely because honestly, we have the Merlin for at least another decade, decade and a half. Um, we need to start looking into her repl their replacement in about five or so years. Or a midlife upgrade. And that's going to be the thing. If we go for a rotary uh, fling, uh, fling wing rotary replacement for the Merlin, that could be interesting. And that would be the point at which we probably get one into service. And that's going to be an interesting scenario because what's going to be available at that time is going to be very different to what's available now. There's a lot of aircraft development in the pipe work. The Osprey is very much old hat. Okay, they're already working on the Super Osprey, which is pretty much a brand new aircraft. It's like the Super Hornet versus the Hornet and all sorts of other ones. So in the nicest way, Osprey is in many ways a legacy first generation rotary fling wing asset. There are far better systems coming down the pipeline. I'd rather keep Merlin in service for the next 10, 15 years and then replace it with something which is far better, far newer, far easier to operate. Then jump in for what is most a complicated old one and be stuck with it for the next 20 to 30 years. Um, Eamon, what do you think of the new EU patrol corvette, the France, Spain, Italy and Greece are sort of thinking building? It looks cool. I like them. I like them. I like the tumble down hull. The new light frigates. It's why I think the new... I, 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 and honestly, when people start telling me, oh, the Type 45 replacement will be a modified Type 26 or a Type 31, and I go, no, it won't be. I'll have a tumble down hull. Um, because that's what are going to be the range by that point. And Britain is not going to want to be the only nation who had a tumble down hull. It does get that petty. It does literally get that petty. Mm. Martin Dorothy, I'm grumpy at not having a like button for comments on here. I know. Sure, Marin, gunboat diplomacy by rapid reaction force. Eh, to an extent. Um, Dr. Estrub, Dr. How many nations have true amphibious capabilities? Australians are building up to it. Japan's building up to it. Brazilians, to a large extent. French, Dutch, to an extent. The I would consider trying to scale with these being able to land up to at least uh, a battle group, if not a light brigade. And then you're looking at French, British, Americans, Italians... Uh, Russians, Chinese, there's a lot of nations with it, actually. There are a lot of nations with it. And Australians are building up to it, definitely. Japanese are building up to it. Brazilians, I'd say, are actually pretty much there. Uh, Mexicans, not really. Egypt, strange enough, theoretically. I'm not sure of reality, but theoretically they do. Well, that's a few. Uh, John Luke, where did LCS go wrong? Was it an attempt to build frigates so cheap it became a massive waste of time money? Uh, did the USN have a problem with frigates, small ship design, and use only? No, the USN have a problem in that they tried to... Okay. They tried to build the small ship equivalent of this, a massive multi-tool, which had have tons of things. And instead of accepting that it was going to be primarily be a hammer everything had to be of the same value so and they decided to develop their own system rather than just going with stanflix off the shelf which was kind of silly so basically instead of building a multi-tool what they did was they built <sighs> they built a drill with lots of drill bits 
and you can take things out and put things in and take things out and put things in and the trouble is the drill bits don't like each other they really don't put that back while well, i remember sorry i was doing some work on the railway earlier today I was having trouble with a section of editing, and so uh, the railway got fixed while I sorted out in my head. Hence all the tools up here. And, surprisingly enough, a few other random things. Uh... Jeff Hill, in the future will RN deploy in one big carriers and fever ships, lumps to optimize the need for support and escort ships? Um, that is the trouble. If you have the more capital ships you have, the more escorts you need to protect them. Which is why when people go, oh, we should have four or five small carriers or all those sort of things and uh, amphibious ships. I go, you'll need more escorts to protect them. Uh, the whole point of my dream center fleet was you could ba you would basically, in the nicest way, the LHDs and the LSLs would operate together in one group with one escort group. Um, the carrier battle group in another escort group, and if you had to, uh, for, uh, another carrier, another LHD together, uh, managed to get the fourth and fifth vessels operational, then you'd have the third escort group ready to go. And you'd have Type 31s and River B3s milling in around them as the extra numbers. That was the whole point of it. And probably Allied ships as well. Job, Doctor, I think you need to give the speech with the hammers to the leaders of most nations. I probably do. Um, I will say this. If you're really worried I'm going to miss a question, if you put at Dr. Alexander Clark on it, it highlights it in, in orange. And I definitely don't miss it. I know it's an important question for me because I also know some questions. Sometimes it's you having a chat with each other in the comments. And I worry I'm going to miss a question in that sometimes. I try not to, but I, I do worry. So if you're really worried I'm going to miss your question... Put at Dr. Alexander Clark in there, and I will definitely see them. Or you can always do a super chat, but yeah. That's just me being greedy and liking my own brew money. <laughs> um, sure, I believe so. Any cargo going from the US port to another port must be on the US ship. Yep, I think that's the Jones Act. Martin Dorothy, that's all. I think, sometimes I think I really think this country has learned or forgotten all the lessons we have learned. Ah, the trouble is history so easily forgotten. <clears throat> Jeff Miller, what is the likelihood of the bulbous nose bow seen on civilian ships showing up on naval ships? Ah, uh, have you seen the hooter on the Queen Elizabeth class? In happy theory in Egypt is very different from reality over there. That's why I said theory. Um, I think Turkey has or is trying to have one. They're trying to. They haven't yet got one. They're trying for it. Uh, Opa, in your full sub video, you mentioned forward basing two SSKs in the Falklands. Wouldn't it be better forward base them in Diego Sierra so they could be closer to the Gulf and South China Sea? Ah, thank you, Kerma Turk, to buy textbooks. That's very kind of you. Um, no, because if I'm going to put any ships forward into this Gulf and South China Sea, they're going to... And Gulf may be an SSK, but I wouldn't want to base one in there, because if you fall base in that region, it's going to be a very big problem. And uh, In the nicest way, if you're going into South China Sea, basing one into some in Singapore, again, is a problem. And there's a lot of SSKs already around there, so actually sending in your nuclear submarines over there is better. That's why you forward base them in the Falklands, because if you have a cover base in the Falklands, you ne less often you will need to send it in a nuclear boat down into the South Atlantic. You also block off the South Atlantic to an extent from the Chinese coming through there that way in their submarines. And so you can then free up your nuclear boat, which is usually hovering near the South Atlantic, to maybe just having one sitting in the centre of the Atlantic, ready to go either way. And one that nuclear boat, which is freed up from the operations, can go... Um, out to that direction, to the Pacific, and go, hello. Hello, China. <laughs> Don't we look cute? We're called astute. We're actually called HMS Artful, you know, because we're so artful. 
and um, we're cute and we're, we're just here to say hi because we just love you so and we just want you to know we're here we're friendly we're a little black sub and we're just gonna wander around the ocean with our anionic tiles and everything and you know if you don't know where we are don't worry we know where you are we're just here to be friendly we really are we're just pals just make sure you don't start bashing up any of our mates because we we'd hate to have to turn nasty we really would <sighs> sorry hms artful and me have a long history Inappy, why does everyone seem to have given up on counter mine warfare? I I haven't given up counter mine warfare. MCMVs are critical. I just think that we're mainly heading for a scenario where it's going to be distributed lethality using unmanned systems from probably more conventional hulls than the uh, rather large plastic ones we currently use. John Luke, uh, what do you think of the planned Type 056 Corvette? Combat effective or an example of putting up numbers of modern ship, uh, modern looking ships? A bit of both. A bit of both. Um, they definitely look very modern. They're very cool. But I think it's the 54s, which are more the Corvettes, aren't they? I'm not sure. Anyway, but they are very good in terms of their numbers, and that helps. Numbers is a help in those things. Um, Tony Pamper, what is current in operation uh, for the railway? Well, it uh, works. Um, I've got the inner line works the whole time. The outer line I am fixing. It's got a couple of electrical issues. And then I've got to start building the buildings on it. And I've already managed to outgrow it in its siding space. I built it with um, seven sidings. And I've already outgrown them and have got more supply. Well, actually, no. Yeah, seven sidings. And currently got more trains and trucks than actually I've got space on it for. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's problematic. We'll leave that on one side. I should really stop visiting eBay occasionally. Um. Come on, Gasmuk. Small carriers. Still such a valuable target that they need about 100 SAM VLS to escort them. Yep. Sure, Mike. I just thought, what is the meaning of life, universe, and everything? I'm told it's 42, but I haven't done enough research to be sure. Gary, speaking of Egypt, is there any update uh, info on the former HMS Wimbrel and Zenith? Not heard anything of them for a while. Uh, I don't think we're going to hear anything. I have a feeling they're going to be lost. So, Thompson, uh, that's luck. Any? I'm sorry, but it's my youngest brother's champagne birthday tomorrow, or I would be happy to shoot for that. There's no. Me joking. Don't worry about that one. It's very nice when people do, but it's not. Frankly, I'm still surprised at how generous people are. My patron is a first read described as uh, surprised at how I'm very surprised how much the patron gets in. And that's definitely gonna keep my book habit going. It's probably gonna cause all sorts of fun when it comes to working out my tax returns, but it's uh, that's gonna be worth it, frankly, for keeping my book habit going. That's gonna be the joy. Uh, John Luke, I, li I like your motor multi-tool example. It seems tech and info overload is affecting designs. We get advanced ships that look nice, but might go down quicker than ever if BT, even if BT was leading them into combat. Please do not even suggest that as a possibility. He might come back from the dead. Don't just don't go there, okay? Don't. Uh, as a clock, H was helpful. One ping for range, please, Vasily. Chinese sub. Who the? What the? Yeah. <laughs> Daniel Freeman? That's good. One dot. That's right. The RN still use Simonstown. If not, would it not be a good idea to open up again? Uh, they do still occasionally visit, but mainly I think it's... um They don't really use it as much as that other thing. I, I, opening it up again would be lovely, but it's having enough forces to actually make it worthwhile and making enough visits for it to be worthwhile to open it up again. We've opened up Bahrain. We've opened up Singapore. Um, Sing Bahrain hasn't got anything forward based in it yet. No, uh, no, Singapore hasn't got anything forward based in it. Bahrain, of course, has HMS Montrose. Mm. 
I, you know, I, I would love to have more, but it's having the budget, having the things, and actually making the case for not just the ships to be built, but the men, the people to be recruited, the manning, the organization, all those things needs to be done. Vision, I'm not reading that out. Um, again, because of who's watching. See my market uh, projects like the Siberian Alaskan Bridge, Sicily North Africa Bridge, etc., become more critical points to defend stretch naval forces. And that they do. Tony Penfold, Railway Mission Creek. Yeah, definitely going on. Definitely. I've already drawn up plans. I haven't even finished this uh, this particular one, and I've drawn up plans for the next to supersized engaged line. This is my railway one, and I've said I've fallen in love with engage a bit because I love. I always had cool times with my OOHO gauge line but um yeah the end gauge there's so much you can do in such a small space literally one of my old uh the spare board i had from my um OOHO line has become the entire railway for the end gauge and it's lovely, but you know what you can do with the, the engaged the amount of space it can it takes up, and the amount of way you get things going around. I've got plans. Let's put it this way: lots of boards like that in future. In some day, when I eventually get my own house and I'm sort of building up, there's going to be boards. There's going to be line. The line's going to be completed. A set of multiple boards put around a room. The line's going to be completed by the trains running along the um, running along the bookshelves, basically. And it's going to go round, and I'm going to have a system so it goes the whole way around the room. I'm not sure how I'm going to function in a door, but possibly that's going to be using a helix. So it goes up and over at one point and comes down at another point. And that could be quite cool. And I would have them, honestly, if I'm going to have helixes, I'm going to have them display helixes with a glass front rather than hidden in that scenario so that you can see the trains going right down and going up. That's my plan, too. What is the status Diego says here as a base? It's mainly for the Americans. We're showing it, but mainly for Americans. <laughs> Tax is careful, there are children present. <laughs> oh. Speaking of BT, um, John Luke, have made a good... Uh, uh, speaking of BT, have made a good tribal class captain, or would he have been in the same comments about ships not working? Uh, BT isn't really good for a tribal class. He's not really good for small ships. He's kind of like um, Somerville. In that regard, not really suited for small ships. Um, Jay Richardson, is an engaged more expensive than Not really. Um, the track, the models, not really more. The trains, about the same prices. And I mostly get mine off eBay, <laughs> second hand, because my it's it's the model it's the railway I'm taking around places for my little cousins to play with and for me to take to when I run the centres when I run A level GC revision centres, I'm gonna take the model railway with me as a bit of a surprise for the kids and let them play a bit if it's the boarding centres. So, um, yeah. Jeff Hiller, what is the force protection of the uh, role of the Gurkha Battalion Brunei, if any? Uh, <laughs> yeah, they they have a little bit, but not much. Most of them. Now, the home reaction. I get you what I mean, what you mean with HO versus engaged. It's why I've chosen one seven hundred over one three hundred fifty build. Uh, the Sarn Horse, uh, uh, once in that scale. Thing was beautiful, but took two... Uh, two um, yeah, I have huge model aircraft carrier. I have a model aircraft carrier made of cardboard, which is about four times the size of this one. But it's downstairs, because it doesn't really fit up in my bedroom. It's currently caked in dust. Because I haven't really dusted up there since I've been, I mean, moving all the books around, I'll be dusting the books and cleaning the books. Haven't got to that sort of space. Um. Uh, Angus, I don't 
that's a plot. Are the artificial islands being created in the South China Sea oppressors position? They are conquest by civil engineering. They're rather like Hadrian's Wall and the Great Wall of China. Um, yes, they're a presence mission, but they're, you know, something you have to deal with. And just for, um, point of order, Alex. Uh, okay, the Bahrain forward base is HMS Jaffair. Thank you, Andy Fault. Uh, Montrose is or was the frigate signed out. She is the frigate signed out. Sorry, I did get Bahrain and Singapore confused at one point. I do apologise for that. I was going through both in my head, and yeah. Uh, Jeff Wheeler, don't natives, uh, don't the Diego Garcians want the Diego Garcia back? Uh, they do, but <sighs> that's a long running one, and I'm not sure they're going to get it. I don't think so. I think it's unlikely. Mainly because. It's too important for many people, especially with China moving into the Indian Ocean and moving into where it is, to keep Britain and especially America committed in the region. And Diego Garcia is a good way of keeping them that, without having them on their shores. So lots of people will say nice things about supporting the, uh, supporting the claims of the indigenous people, but actually enforcing it is another matter. Kevin Dank, do you think a US versus China or another Korean War? I prefer not either, as both could turn bad quite quickly. I prepare, I, my view is always you prepare for them, but you hope not to have them. Worst one is US versus China, but, um, but there again, Korean War could lead to US versus China. I visited on recent trip to South Africa and got to see a, less, a lesser spotted SSK going out to sea, as well as penguin seals and other nice uh, things. Hmm, Arthur Doherty, Dennis Freeman. Mm, there's an interesting conversation going on here. Oh, Simon's Town. Yeah. Night Heron Production. Still keeping my Hornby Flying Scotsons. Plural. <laughs> That's good. Come on, Good. I have earphones because I would have to rebuild uh, uh, rebuild Soda and Misty Island for my son. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, they are great. Engage, you can do that then. If all tribals reappeared in Portsmouth in perfect condition tomorrow, what would you do with them? Upgrade Zect, or where would you send them to maximize their homicidal presence? Uh, oh, how would you upgrade the tribal design? Oh, that's too difficult. Honestly, the tribals are very good for their time, but if I was going to pick one of the classes I've studied to reappear tomorrow, it would be the Daring class, because you could upgrade them more easily. Um, you'd fix their engines, starters. You'd put in modern turbine units and modern propulsion. You would probably need to fix their gun. Uh, you see, it's so much easier with the slightly bigger Daring class, because you could actually fit so much on them more. Um... They would be great presence OPV ships, but they wouldn't be great warships for modern time because they're not big enough. If you're talking about a modernized tribal, you're talking about a modern version of a tribal, you're probably talking um, five odd, five to six thousand tons for a workable ship. See what? Had Jack Scooby nearby, so I have Kido Bataya literally. Well, also both Yamato's 10 to 1 boats. Uh, ten, uh, ten, oh, ten Birmingham World War One cruisers and a seaplane. Guys, should also and should a very small power of pewter models. Cool. So, Thompson, take care. Good luck. Stephanie Wilson, Jeffy, yes, the Ch uh, Churchill gave C Diego C to USA a part of the Lend Lease deal. Ah, vision. Mother uses my model, the train set for Char uh, from Charters Christmas time. Around the tree. No room for a proper model train layout. Oh, That's why you have Engage. Literally. Um, as you can see, that is my Engage railway. And you can see it's quite sort of nice and viable. And it's two complete tracks, circuits round. It's cool. As you can see, there's also a voltmeter sitting in there. 
Hence me knowing that the outer line has two points on it, which aren't working properly. Uh, Strub, Doctor, will RNRM ever have pre-positioned squadron forces like the US has in DG? Probably not. Doctor Skimmer, hello from Belgium. Sorry, but can't watch the stream tonight. Oh, sorry to hear that, but hope you have a good evening. Um, SNPI, Doctor Clark, the SimSec has not yet posted the Biltrons 4 and 5. Any idea of the time point Biltrons 4 and 5 being posted? Should be very soon. They are have lots of plans for it. It was supposed to be posted last week, but it got delayed because they wanted to do a big launch. A really big launch, because it's proved popular. They're nice people. They're a very good charity. And this is the one thing I will make say for them. Simsec are entirely funded by charitable donations. So they do have on their site, you can find the PayPal link and various things for them to donate, which they can have because they have a business account. And... Um, that the you know they are dependent upon charitable donations basically so that's how they're funding all the things they are funding for us to have the stream they are funding for us to have all these sort of things and we're just supplying the material i edit it put it together um drac has taken over most of the recording because he does the recording as actually using the skype recording function usually and then turns it into an mp3 because my mp3 recorder for skype keeps not working and he always does the backup, and we end up doing using the backup more often than not. And then we just uh, we just, I, I edit it, add in usually chop out the bits where we're just chatting slightly beforehand and chatting slightly afterwards, because we usually have quite long conversations. Then we turn on the record and uh, add in the music beforehand and the music afterwards, and you know make it everyone good and make it all look sound professional. But send it in, and then they post. <clears throat> from Marsh, for far too many O gauge and engage models, we're talking 50 locos. Sadly, they're large in loft and nowhere to run them. That is a shame. Jeff Wheeler, when did the first destroyer captains make flag rank? Was there a notable effect offhand? I can only think of Tovio and Cunningham. Were they among the first? Um, well, actually, there is someone quite very senior you can think of who was a destroyer captain. He's called Thrit. He's the first one who really gets high up, um, having had a career in destroyers. And there are lots who come after him. You've got Henderson, you've got all sorts of officers who come through the destroyer ranks. Any officer who was described as a torpedo specialist, etc., starts off in destroyers. Um, as a rule, rather than submarines at the time. And so all sorts of things, they've come through and they've become quite senior. So there's lots of them. There is a bit of a difference though. They are slightly more aggressive than their counterparts and it does affect the Navy. Um, Angus Sonner, do the video game train simulators defeat the point? You see, I prefer mucking around the real thing because you can't get electrocuted by the, the, the train simulator. Uh, Tony Penfold, no, I agree works on the railway. Very disappointing. It's only got one platform in at the moment. And I only put that in so I can measure the length of the tra trains and make sure it's long enough for the trains and carriages, which is why I decided to go on a free coach set rather than a fellow coach set. John Luke, what ships under development presently do you highly rate? Type 41 cannot be included, sorry. Ooh, um, I like the Type 26s. The variations on them look pretty cool. I think CGX has some options. Sure interesting. Um, the little Air French, Franco Italian, everyone light frigate, the Brelules, um, are pretty cool as well. There's a lot of good little ships around. I'm not very keen on the new German designs. The new German designs look absolutely terrible. But we'll leave that to one side. 
Um, I talk about it. We talk about this a lot in Bilge Pumps, which we recorded um, this week. So, yeah. It's a, there are some nice ones going around. Jane, it looks like you, uh, you need an upgrade of bedroom. This has been... Oh, yeah. I, I, I do need to do some work. And I do need to... Yeah, at some point, but... At the moment, it's been a... It, usually, it's going to sound strange. My bedroom... I have a lot of books at work, in my office at work, and books spread around and all these things. And when I thought it was going to come lockdown and everything was coming, I sh brought books home at a rapid rate and all sorts of things. So a lot of stuff has been crammed in here, which wasn't necessarily in here before. Ooh. Vision, it's a nice set, but I don't even have room for that. I bought a few years ago a Japanese series Zero Shinkansen bullet train set. Just to stare at from time to time. Perhaps someday. Well, I will cross fingers for you. Um, <laughs> Jermak, uh, Transport Fever 1 and 2 in <laughs> London are more like model railways, and without them, tycoon strategies. Hmm. Carl and Gasper, Afik, the Soviets had a small railway in the hangar of Moscow, Moscow helicopter, used for arming the aircraft. Cool. I didn't know that one, actually. Uh, Strub, during World War II, how good was Jap uh, Japan's amphibious capability versus the U.S. Britain in 1939? Okay, they had more technical ships. They had, some more, they had the technical ships available, the actual special ships, but they only had them in a small number. So they had the ships, the sort of the more advanced systems ready to go, but they didn't have them really available in large numbers and they didn't expand them, whereas the British went, mm. so, you know, it's half a dozen, one, six, and out. They're even in some respects. Someone's calling me again. Back in a second. Sorry about that. Hang on. E bike. Right then. So let's just 
move some of these around to here. See that? Right. Okay. Right then. Danny Freeman, and Dr. Clark, my uncle lives in Halifax, Yorkshire, and is a member of a model rail group. And it's a large building, four mil to build and lay out out in. Ooh, that sounds cool. Yes, I have been to National Rail Museum. Um, SNPI, Dr. Clark, why did Japanese call their helicopter carrier a flat top destroyer rather than what it is, a carrier? They're not supposed to have aircraft carriers. So they nicked the idea from the British. Who of course had through deck cruisers, the Japanese have through deck destroyers. Vision. I saw a model rail in Germany that included a seaport with World War One armoured cruiser in tugs floating under remote control in the real water. The trains crossing uh, crossing swing bridges. Cool. Bad home. What is it that makes military equipment grow bigger? I mean, cell phones got smaller, modern engines get smaller for the same, but Obviously, it ships get bigger. Why? Why could a Type Twenty Three not be effective? Well, okay. So, ships grow bigger. Ten uh, tends to be because the systems they are containing have grown bigger, and because you want them to operate in more effectively at longer ranges. If you're taking fuel for a longer way, if you're taking all the supplies and all the facilities you need, the aircraft on board will grow bigger. Let's be honest. Modern helicopters, the Merlin versus the Sea King versus the various helicopters that came aboard, it's much, much, much bigger, much heavier. The weapon systems, the missiles are much bigger, the amount of computers and all these things need to run up bigger, the space for the crew now, if you're going to be operating long range, they need more space and there might be less crew, but they expect a better quality of life because it's nicer to them. And the other things you're building into the ship in terms of its damage protection and its fire control and these things, they'll make the ship very, very bigger. And then you have the other uh, joy of radars and how high you're putting them up. And so you end up with a cone head like Type 45, where you need to be certain, you need to have a certain beam and length to really support that height. So this is why ships grow bigger. Basically, it's the needs of the systems put in them. Uh, John Luke, what do you think would be effective? Uh, be effective of replacing the drinking water on tribal survival brew? Would that the fun have ended, never ended? Oh, good lord! You know there are easier ways of having you know, from of ending up in a scenario where you have a destroyer trying to take on an armored division, okay? Without giving them iron brew and them charging up some some poor unsuspecting German canal. Banham, it's a desire to counter the other guys from uh, thing for which you need to be larger and his thing is bigger than your original because it was designed to counter it. Yeah. To be honest, it's because you're including so much in that and you expect to operate so far away. The Japanese use a lot of semantics when labeling their self defense forces. Yes. It might be my undoing, but if I can get the locos made, uh, uh, made, I might endeavor to make King's Cross in 1700 one day. Static, of course. I, I, I might be nuts, but I'm not that much of a person. You could give it a go. It could be fun. Sorry, Doctor. Do you think a US and British invasion would still need to secure a major port, or could the equipment come over the beach? Depends. If you don't have landing platform docks and LHDs, and all those other systems which can move large stuffs over the beach, then guess what you're going to need to do? Basically, you getting rid of landing platform docks or the or an LHD or the, sort of the equivalent of them is um, you saying that when you're going to be moving in large equipment that supports amounts of heavy equipment and supporting uh, larger land forces, you're always going to have access to major seaports, and if not, you're going to somehow seize them without having your own major uh, your own heavy equipment.
it's cost saving. It looks good on paper. Because you get to go, well, we haven't used this in two decades, in a decade or so. Average every 21 years. If you go back through 1980s, 1960s. Well, you know, you've got Korea and Suez in the 1950s. So maybe that counts for a bit. You have all sorts of operations going on by the Americans in the 1960s. 1970s, you have operations. 1980s, 1990s. Uh, major amphibious operations happen quite regularly. Uh, but um, they get forgotten so quickly. So, so SMPI, how, Dr. Clark, how much of the RN culture do you still see in the various spin-offs of the RN, like the RAN, RCN, Indian, any Pakistani? Um, you still see a fair amount. You still see a fair amount. It's kind of interesting. I did some work a while back ago when I was talking with the Indian Navy, and they're a sort of curious mixture of Royal Navy and, you know, various things. Yeah, this shelf is feeling the strain. There are lots of shelves feeling the strain in my room. But luckily, they are um, solid IKEA belly bag bookshelves, so they're okay. They take the strain quite happily. Although I am tempted to start building some of them up with maybe a central supporting strut. Good afternoon, Federico. Hello, fluffy research assistant. You okay? It's okay. He's okay. He's just um, complaining because he hasn't gone out yet. He wants to go in the garden, and my sister is getting to it. Um, Martin, Arthur, you really need to visit Miniature Wonderland when everything is up. I uh, definitely do. There are some awesome engaged railways going around. Um, Frederick, when did the sanitation plants become effective on ships to the point water was not required to be refilled in port? Okay, they've started. Ha they've started having those sort of facilities from a, about the at various points. You start to see them creeping in nineteen hundreds onwards. They become very critical assets as time goes on. Uh, various forms of desunlization and various forms of techniques used to it. And so pretty much it's... As ships have had enough power to be able to run them, they quickly worked out how to do it, and it became useful. But still, they were still changing water imports quite regularly when up until sort of... It's, um, probably until just after the Second World War. There were still quite a lot of ships, which, which are, even though they had the plants aboard, they still take on water when they were at ships, uh, uh, when they were at, um, when they were in port. Because you didn't always trust your desalinization plant. Jeff, the RCN is more like the RN in strategy these days. Sending ships all over the world, the officers are very happy to have their... Mm. The RCN and the RN are working together a lot. Paul Johnson, Dr. Watts, HS Queen Elizabeth was seen off Scarborough this morning. Any idea where she was going? Probably still taking part in Operation uh, Crimson something? Uh, they, they were really obviously trying to avoid the idea of being linked to Red Storm Rising, but they used Crimson and I went, just was kind of going, oh my lord. Um, basically, that was their sort of big thing to get them operational. Operation Crimson something. I've forgotten what the exact word is. Um, Tony Pemper, what deliverance would you like to see in delivering soldier and equipment to the beach? Didn't I see a fast landing craft ideas recently? There are some cool fast landing craft. I would really like to see... You see, I've been looking at the fast landing craft and the various systems coming up, and I do like the idea of a fast landing craft 
And I do like the idea of bringing back to an extent LSTs. And if I was designing my perfect group and able to use the things which aren't in service yet, I probably would have gone for an LHD, an LSL, and uh, three or four LST sort of ships as currently being looked at by the US, uh, US Navy, US Marine Corps. But leaving that to one side, landing craft are always going to be a sort of a pretty critical asset. But the trouble is, if you go for the fast landing craft, you get that speed at expense of something. It might be at their ability to carry loads. It might be at their ability to take certain high seas. They might be really, really slow when it's really and when it's really rough weather. So you have to always factor in what things you want. What I would really like to see in terms of ship to shore for the British perspective is to have some sort of amphibious vehicle which would take the Royal Marines straight ashore and then organically move them around, um, which is why I keep going on about the US Marine Corps APC program, because that's about the only one viable at the moment. Angus Asano, when you're an amphibious assault force, every problem looks like a beach. Yeah, I can see that one. That's a good one. Strub, the growth of naval aircraft is amazing. I was on a CV Yorktown in Charleston. Let's see. Size difference between the F4 and the F6 is unreal. Yep. I was a risky. On my beh on on my to be uh, to build uh, be built shelf. HMS Samaras, HMS Lance, HMS Vega, RP Purin, RP Bazanka, RP Kalski, RP Salzwick, all cardboard, all one two hundred scale. I like British destroyers. They are good things. They are lovely good ones. The original Woodworth. Yeah, that is my fluffy research assistant making noise going. It's almost nine o'clock, Papa. You should take me out at nine thirty. Baron Roy, ship cats or tot of grog. Which would you prefer to be reintroduced if they had to be? P.S. I've forgiven my cat. She is far too cute. I like the ship's animals. I think also they're quite good to have on a ship for morale. I, I you know having a little dog or a little cat. Can be quite a cat can be quite a useful thing on ship, and we do have the ship's cat on from HMS Queen Elizabeth has its own Twitter account and is followed quite well why now and it's a pretty cool thing, so I would say the cat definitely. See what Sunfly's radio control planes once with thirty mile per hour tailwind his plane clocked over a hundred miles per hour engine very powerful and six generator. Wow, ish. Sorry, Doctor. IKEA furniture does not do well in military transfers, so I built my bookshelf out of two by six boards. Before the mover came over, and I have to tell the company to bring extra book boxes. <laughs> yeah, my dream is to have custom shelving. Well, it would have to be customized shelving to have a little railway running for it. And you know proper things and sort of, but that's a very very that's a few levels financially away from me. That's basically if I reach professor paychecks. Um, yeah, I might get there. You never know, and it'd be nice. It'd be nice to have it sort of around them. And it's something which mainly I can keep as an ongoing project to muck around with when I need the brain space. Pardon me. Well, like Crimson Ocean. It might well have been Crimson Ocean. I'm not sure, though. John Luke, I found reading about the Lion class. HMS Lion was due to be built on the uh, time. World War II rolled to my hometown of the best battleship ever. It's just not fair. Yes, that is definitely true. It, looked, it robbed the time of a lot of things, actually, but you did get some pretty decent aircraft carriers. Uh, SMPI, uh, Dr. Clark, do you think the increased radioactivity observed in the Baltic Sea recently may be another Russian SSM leaking radioactivity without their knowledge? Honest? <sighs> Judging by its plume, it's something having a bad time. It is something having a bad time, but what is having a bad time, we're not quite sure. In that area... Considering the age of their SSNs, it's disturbingly likely. But I prefer not to speculate and cause a panic or a load of Russian trolls to turn up in my comments calling me an evil person. 
um, without good cause. In this case, I merely say I have my suspicions about it. I did tweet out about it the other day because I'd spotted it. I'm still going, and that's interesting. Jeremy, French landing capture in EDR, EDAR looks like a nice concept. It does look a nice concept. I'm tempted by it, but I want to see what beaches it can do. What can it get it do on the things? Um, Ben or uh, you got the SO Northumbria through the largest commercial ship built in the UK at the time. Uh, yes. Um, comes with Saxonia. Boilers need properly conditioned water, not just desalinated. The, yeah, that's the trouble. But I didn't realise that initially at the beginning. They thought just desalinated was enough. How did a Royal Marines um, that. How big a Royal Marines detachment would a forward base Type 31 have and. What could they be useful? You'd probably be looking at 30 to 40 up to Royal Marines. You could if they wanted, probably you more normally 20, but they would be used for boarding missions, presence missions, all sorts of things. Probably would include a small band attachment if they're sensible. Diplomacy helps. And they're good medics. Um, John Luke, what name should be given to Type 31, Type 45, the place uh, successors to ensure they don't get cancelled or cut down? Ultra arrows, counties, or something else? Type 26 have gone. have gone ta uh, cities. Um, honestly, that's probably the safest thing you can do. It's probably going to be counties, cities, oh, all sorts of options, but it's going to be something with place names. Interesting enough, the Type 45s, uh, Type 23s, which got cut, were the ones which hadn't been named. I think. Well, they weren't really publicly considered the ones which were cut. Rich Hughes, good product placement there. Uh, hmm. Has anyone Strub? Ha has anyone had issues with significant other trying to organise your books? Um, well, mm, no one's ever tried to organise my books because I tend to keep them organised in various titles. I have the books I'm currently using closest to me. Then the books, which are my quick reference, and I'm always popping over to there. And then the books, which are the rest of the plethora, slowly work from the ones I use most often to the ones I use least often. It's all worked out in my head. Sure, Mike. Nothing is wrong with Russian submarines. It is the best submarine ever designed. They are much quieter than the capitalist junk of submarines. <laughs> yeah, you can say that, Sean. Daniel Freeman, HMS Swing Constituency. It's tempting. It's definitely tempting. Sorry, distracted by a message from Drac there.
he and I are working on a little, I haven't got, I have managed to develop this afternoon, a little side project, a little side thing, which you might find very exciting when it comes out. Um, Jeff, either did or main tour Gurkhas have bagpipes? I think both can get access to them if they want them. Um, Paul Johnson, Idris Boris, that wouldn't be cancelled. Oh, depends who becomes the, what happens next. Carl Gasberg, a Russian sub is a capitalist one, unless sold to China or North Korea. Mm, yeah, to an extent. To, in, to an extent of capitalism as during the uh, to the Russian model. Excellent. If Drac wants to send you a message, he should do it in the chat line. Right we promise not to moan. Do you mind? Ah, no, no. It's a. It was a file about something. He's. It, we're working on something to go. Said it. Well, you know, I, we've both had a similar idea in the thing sort of scenario game, which scares Jamie. Um, he and I, both me and Drac, it turns out because I sent a message to him saying I had this idea, and he had also had had an idea which is similar, and so now we're sort of working together on it, on an idea which is, it's pretty cool. It'll be very good when it comes. Uh, SMPI, Dr. Luck, with the increasing size of dead zones in various seas, are we likely to see a restart of the concept of armed ships escorting fisheries fleets? Looking at what's been going on with counter piracy and having a friend who works dealing with what are at sea armories and armed personnel who move from ship to ship and the various companies which supply those things, including huge Chinese and Russian contingents, um, I think we're already there. Martin Dorothy, I'm not touching that one with a barge pole. Oh, I don't know. Someone just sent me a message going, can you send me a link? I've lost, I managed to lose my contact. Okay, last few minutes. Because I am going to have to go walk. Is it puppy? Because he is being very well behaved, but I can hear him making complaints. Because the trouble is, the only person in the house who's allowed out is me. Um, John Luke, Russian submarines have a perfect service record. It is all scurrious and rumour. You're also invited to holiday in Siberia this winter. Ooh. Ooh. Well, as I've admitted before, I am a, um, and you can find this out, so I don't see it. There are some people who tell me to hide them. I just go, oh, that's silly. I'm a former, uh, a former conservative borough councillor in Epsom Newell. I stood because I was upset with a bridal pass for being treated by our ruling party, which was is the still ruling party of Epsom Newell, which is the Residence Association of Epsom Newell. But um, I, of course, work in academia. So I'm used to doing body swerves to avoid politics because mine are probably whilst... You know, I, I am just sort of the other side of the coin from many of my colleagues. Many of my colleagues are one side of the coin and the other, slightly the other side. So it's often easier just to not talk politics. But trust me, we have plenty to talk about. Students, marking and cake. Those are critical subjects, frankly, as far as most academics are concerned. Night Night Angus. Uh, take care of your fluffy research assistant. I will do. <laughs> Good night, Dr. Rock. Thank you for answering my questions. Take care, this NPI. Uh, right, message on. Uh, Steam White, yes, I do know, but again, I remind you, I've got little cousins watching. Hi, Brock. Right. Would HMS Brexit ha have, uh, who knows? 
Johnny, Russian submarines have the same rules as Fight Club. Probably. Jay Richardson, don't get why most academics are on left leaning. I'm at engineering uni and everyone is very central. Yeah, that's pretty much what I meant. I teach engineering, history of engineering, it's engineering students. And most of my colleagues are pretty much centre line and they're, they'll be one side of the centre or the other side of the centre. And frankly, they're mostly centre. So you drop them. And as I've said before, my view on politics is very, very old fashioned in terms of the conservative sector. Because my belief is that you shouldn't use ideology when making decisions in politics. You should look at the evidence and go with which is the best solution, which fits with the evidence you have available of the scenario. I don't care where that solution is left, right, or wherever it comes from. I just want to deliver the best solution for the people who've elected me. But that gets you. That's very, very old fashioned, which is probably why just a local borough councillor for one term. Right. Um, as the questions do seem to be drying up, and as the puppy has been very good, I am going to say... <laughs> HMS Bodicea. Ooh. See, the thing is, that name gets banded around a lot, and it would be quite a cool name, but as also, I think if anyone actually did some research on her, they might not be as in love with her as they, th they think they should be, considering some of the stuff she did, and con considering modern views. But that's the thing, though. You shouldn't judge past character. You should judge past persons by the theories of their time, which were prevalent. Not necessarily the minority view, but the majority view at the time. And that is what you should judge them by. If they manage to succeed, the minority view becomes the majority view later on. That's great. You judge those later peoples by that view, which is now the majority. It doesn't mean the majority are right or wrong. There's... Don't ever treat history as good and bad. There are very few people, there are very few events which neatly fix in a, a fit in a box of good people or bad people. Good thing or bad thing. Very few things. There are things which do, there are a few people who do. But very, very few. That's far majority. In vast majority, it's a sea of grey. Take care. Right. Uh, so I finished the questions. Remember I said that some subs did not launch CRMs on Syria in 2018 because Russian ASW units had one or two close. True? Um, I don't think so, Carl. Uh, John, thanks for asking questions to you. Always a pleasure. Strub, fishery enforcement is super challenging. As someone who does the boardings, the regulations are unreal. I, w I wish more people knew about fishery vessels than what they see on, uh, see on the Discovery Channel. Oh, yeah. Take care. Um, Second one, that's what I remember that when that was the way to do things. We need to get better to that. Yes, it trouble is it doesn't work well in creating tweets. You can talk about doing it that way. Um, <laughs> undaunted fud. It looks like I showed up just in time to say goodbye. You did, but take care. And I hope you, I hope you've managed to enjoy watching it back. And there is a list of the books which we reviewed, and I will try and add in timings etc. to make it easier to find things. Frederica, also pleasure. Martin, pleasure. Take care. Um, Romans were just as bad, yes, but the thing is, they weren't. Neither side was good or bad. They were just what they were at the time. That's the that's the trouble with any good history. Uh, Come on, history is between dark grey and darker grey parties, <laughs> possibly. Uh, night night, Jay Adam. Um, Jet night time production. Good night. Next one in particular. Yes, the next one is going to be fun. I've got two good videos this week. Um, so thank you to the subscribers. Thank you to everyone who's been watching all the things. And this week we have how the, the how the Battle of Malaya could have been fought if I was in charge. <laughs> and tribals, battles, and daring's. And then on the four the brew ships next Saturday, Sunday is on the Soviet uh, on the superpowers. So it's going to be a wonderful week. And I'm going to actually upload the videos and block them in for the next month. And of course, tomorrow, for all those who are patrons, it goes live, the suggestions uh, thing goes live, and then, as I said, in a week's time after that, I will take off four or five from there, put them in a voting poll, and the two highest votes win for next month. 
for August. Right, so take care, enjoy. Night night, Jay Richardson. Night night, Kevin. Night night, Daniel. <laughs> Kevin, Tung night night. Uh, Steve White, night. Frederico, night. And Stephanie, <laughs> night night. Thank you. Uh, the Romans really knew the use of the small hammer and the large sledgehammer. That is, they did. The fact that I need to use hammers sometimes to demonstrate these things, it actually is quite worrying, but it works. Take care, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Anna, I hope you will have a good evening. Good walk to Fluffy Research Assistant. I will, though. He's going to have a lot of... He's, he'll, he'll have a nice walk. He enjoys his walks. Right. Thank you. I have to go around the back to turn this off now, because... I've started using it because I use this for the messages. I used a big camera on the front of the, on the back, uh, you know, the main camera on the phone rather than the um, screen camera. Take care.